Hello, hello. All right. I think everybody's on on their way. Close enough. So we'll call the meeting to order. Give everybody a second to find their seats. And of course, I don't have. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> Took a while. <laughs> All right. Well, let's take attendance. Uh, Alan. John, here. Greg, here. Michelle, here. Jim is not here, Stephanie, here. Lisa, she's not here, Michael, here. Julie, here. Jennifer, here. Peter, here. thank you, we have a quorum, great. So is there any public comments on the agenda items? Seeing none, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Are there any questions regarding the consent agenda item. Hearing none, the consent agenda passes, and we'll move on to uh, the board, uh, chair's report. I'll start with, uh, I guess, and if we are we are on our way. Uh, if you <laughs> even driving in in the dark, the place looks different. You know, a few uh, few things are now missing, and uh, but uh, clearly progress is being made. So um, here, here we go. Um, uh, I'd like to, uh, you know, congratulate again everybody who got us to where we are today. Um, a lot of work by a lot of people, and and I also want to commend um, Megan. The uh, groundbreaking ceremony I think was uh, well done, and uh, and it was a nice touch to invite the um, descending towns to join us. It was a it was a good. Um, tangible outreach to show them that we really do want them to be part of uh, this adventure. So uh, well done there. The executive committee met uh, this past week to discuss the process and methodology we'll use for the superintendent's evaluation. Uh, I'll say that um, we, we made a fair amount of progress to that end. I think some very good progress and we, we kind of went off on a few tangents but related tangents about roles and responsibilities, divisions of responsibilities between the board and the administration and the superintendent, and making sure that we were putting together um, a process that fairly measured the superintendent as the superintendent. Um, and uh, so I, I think it was very healthy. So we'll get back together in another couple of weeks and we should hopefully have something to present to the board before we, uh, I'd say early December. I think uh, we should we should be prepared. So I, I'm pretty pleased with the progress on that one. Um, and uh, I guess the, uh, the last item is I'd like to wish everybody a uh, happy Thanksgiving. So, and with that, Megan. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I did want to just comment on the groundbreaking ceremony because I know we broke a lot of kids' hearts by not having them invited to the ceremony. And it was difficult because of the fact we had limited space outside and trying to organize all of that. So um, we are going to make certain that we are mindful of our ribbon cutting ceremony. And even if we have to get invitations to our students who have graduated and our freshmen somewhere at some college, we want to make certain that they are part of it. We recognize the fact they are going to be inconvenienced. It was not something which they were not uh, right on our, our thoughts and, and and we appreciate everything, but we also recognize the limitations. That said, I'm also incredibly proud of the kids who came to Mrs. Gallo and specifically asked to attend and even gave up some of their lunch time and some of their free time in order to participate. So if that is not an endorsement of this program, I don't know what is. Um, so a couple things that we have going on. We are looking currently at some of our bus practices for elementary school students and their drop-off. Um, we know that parents are able to indicate 
if they don't want their students to get off the bus if a parent is not present or supervised. Um, but how we are publicizing that and how we're letting parents know that option is something we're exploring at this time. So I am working with Bob Geeson, Pam from All Star, and our elementary principals um, to make certain that we're communicating in a way that doesn't uh, create fear. Right now our practice has been uh, very good, it's, but we never want to know that a child has ever been dropped off and we want to make certain supervision and safety are at the forefront of everything we do. So we are exploring some of those, how we're communicating that option, but it is an option for parents. Speaking of our elementary schools, uh, today Washington Primary hosted their annual senior day. Um, it was absolutely wonderful. We had some, some fabulous guests. Our students were servers. Our students were the performers. And um, when I went and asked people at the tables, many of them, their grandchildren graduated from Washington years ago, but they still just love coming out year after year. Um, additionally, Burnham School held their harvest gathering today. Um, I can tell you it's a little bit hard to feel harvesty when we have snow on the ground. However, they were making turkeys and collages and working with their, their parents and guests. So, And tomorrow, Booth Free is holding their annual spelling bee and pie eating contest. I get to be a judge. Yay. <laughs> so we have lots of activities. And again, it's, it's a perfect time of year because we're reminding our students that they're connected. They're part of this community and that they have much to be thankful for. So we'd like to put out those celebrations to our whole community. Um, Chapog had had a visit from the assistant director and producer, Greg White, to speak to our students in TV production and broadcasting class. Uh, Greg was known for his work on Law and Order and the Good Shepherd, so our students are learning from some amazing experts. So it is one in which, again, for a small school, we're drawing some big crowds. Um, we're also very proud that the seal of biliteracy has been granted to students. Uh, we had that celebration. And this is for students who can show proficiency in English in one other language as measured by the AAPPL language test. Do not ask me what that acronym stands for. I have zero idea. Kim, do you know? Okay. I, okay, thank you. <laughs> um, tomorrow is our health and wellness day. And so I know that our PE teachers and wellness teachers are working on a showcase for our students. The Chapog debate team hosted its second annual Connecticut Debate Association League Tournament. Uh, thank you to Wilson King's coordination as part of his senior project. Our debate coach, uh, Fran Belson, um, was able to help lead our uh, team to a second place trophy. They had 168 competitors, 16 schools around the state, and they all got to see our wonderful Chapog under construction. <laughs> Um, and of course, we have some athletic updates. So one of the very proud moments for Chapog is not just the fact that we have our athletes, not just that they're scholar athletes, but they are great sportsmen. And so when we look at being one of 19 schools to win the Michaels Cup Award for Unified Sports through the Connecticut Association of Schools, I think that's a testament to our students being role models, being inclusive, and being supportive of all. Um, and of course, we have to congratulate our girls cross country team who won the Berkshire League and the state cross country runner ups. Um, congratulations to Elish Foy, our freshman who placed third in states and well done to Coach Sphere. And our boys soccer program made it to the first round of states. And that's all I'm going to say about that. But we are very proud of all of our athletes and the accomplishments that they've done. Moving forward to personnel. Can we keep going with personnel? Okay. Um, and for our personnel, uh, we had announced uh, at last session that Elizabeth Horton, our literacy tutor, had had her baby. However, I wanted to make certain I shared that she has a leave of absence from October 30th to December 10th. Um, Alicia Hines, our world language teacher at Chapog, we are anticipating her leave of absence uh, January 6th through April 1st for her little arrival as well. Um, booth free, we know we will have three 
additional announcements for upcoming. Um, <laughs> so stay tuned and don't drink the water at Booth. All right. And sorry, going through. I'm going to scroll back to my screen for. Uh, sorry. My board agenda, I wanted to make certain. All right, and the last topic that I have on our agenda is I do want, actually, I'd to open up and have a conversation if the chair would allow so. Um, I'm looking to talk a little bit about the idea of digital snow days. Um, a digital snow day would be a day in which our students are able to do some applied work at home rather than coming into school that day. And a snow day, um, what happens right now is the um, De State Department of Education mandates 180 days of school. We currently have 183 days of school. Many of our surrounding communities are currently exploring a three-hour delay for those days you really want to just get those kids in, try to conserve a day. I'm going to tell you I lived that role as a principal, having a three-hour delay. You get the kids in, you essentially have time to feed them, you get time to take off their jackets, <laughs> and then they're back out the door. It's really not a day in which instruction is rich. It may be something that instead what we consider is allowing some applied learning to happen. But before doing that, and this is obviously just something that we're still in the infancy of, I'd like to hear some of the thoughts of what the board has to say, some of the things you'd like to see explored, some of the concerns that you have. Um, because we do have those three days in which are above the state mandate. The state is not behind going into the 180 days with a digital snow day at this time. At this time. It is one in which it is one where for me, I'd want to consider what are equity issues for our students. We'd have to consider what it looks like at each grade level. But I'd also like to hear some of the thoughts of the board as we've just started to peek behind the curtain on this. Um, I, I think it sounds great, just funnily enough, like the last snow day. Um, Nora's kindergarten teacher has a section on her website called Links for Learning, and we were on it, so she was able to do some of that stuff. But just piggybacking on your equity concerns, what if you know kids don't have access to computers? How do they you know, participate, how do we measure that? How do we get them involved? So, I mean, that's one of the big, obvious, I guess, concerns. Um, just along the, those same lines, I mean, I think we're fortunate as a district in that we provide each of our students with um, a minimum level of technology. However, where it could come into play is what if um, the parents don't have internet access? I would imagine that in the three towns, that's a very small number, but I think we need to have a contingency plan in place for parents, some parents who either, because they live in a remote area of one of the towns where they don't have internet access for some reason, or they choose not to have internet access so that th those students would still not be disadvantaged. I have a question. Can you make a distinction, like, uh, like when you talk about the three-hour delays and thinking about it rather than at a district level, but you know, would a three-hour delay be looked at or considered differently at nine to nine through twelve versus K to five? You know, you could bring ninth graders in f for productive half a day, even if it's a three-hour delay, mm -hmm. um, and considering their workloads and and you know AP courses, it might be worth bringing in the high school on a three hour delay and not bringing in the middle schools. Is that a practice that's, we've, is that even allowed? Messes up our contracts. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna echo. Um, it would be an issue regarding teachers unions, equity of workload, making certain, additionally, um, we have constant time that we expect students to be um, working 
I hate to call it seat time, but at some time it is. It's 900 hours that the state requires of us. And so we do look all at grades. that, all grades. Well, and the bus contract, because we would have to run, when, if, the, if the K-5 is making the time up at the end, but we've run the high school on one run, and then we have to run another run, on another day, we're bringing the drivers back. I think that's part of it, why we don't usually separate Well, everybody knows I'm all over this, so I won't talk too much um, because I've already talked to Megan about this. I think it's a great idea, and I've been uh, hoping for this for a while because of knowing that there are other states that do this. Um, and it really has to do with uh, whether the state is interested. And from, I was disappointed to hear from Megan just now that they're really not at the moment because it is a little bit of a work on their part because it has to be a concept of equity and standardization has to be in place for all the schools in the state so that uh, maybe there are schools that, as long as they're standardized plans, there may be schools that due to their makeup can't, be, can't offer this because they don't have one-to-one -one technology or their students are too far afield or there's too many of them, or who knows what it is. But nothing's gonna happen even for a system that might be set like ours is because we have one-on-one -on -one technology and we figure out whether the, the, the families have um, uh, internet access. We still can't do anything, even if we're interested, because the state has to set up the guidelines to make sure that every student is protected from A, this lack of parity, and B, the definition of what a school day is. And that's something that I found out other states have gone through that work to legislate what a school day is, what, I forget what it's called, something learning, standard learning, there's something about it. Um, and it's not necessarily, um, it, it is a number of hours. It's not necessarily a full school day, but they they imply that you really have to have um, actual learning as opposed to just homework or work to do. Um, and so there's a lot of complexity in that, but it just seems that are we defenseless until something forces the state to want to do this? Or is it, you know, do we, do we talk to politicians? What? Well, <laughs> as far as us as a district, we have three days to play with if it is something um and it is one we can also talk about is the title digital snow days too much is it something where project-based learning days or or something where because maybe our younger students instead they they have a project they have to do um for applied learning it it really this is kind of again we're in an infancy infancy um it's also one to say we're not doing anything yet <laughs> i wanted to talk openly as a board to think about some of the things that as we enter into uncharted territories, things you'd like to have me explore. Because when I say to you, I, I can't drop below the threshold of 180 days. There, there's nothing we can do that is a state requirement. But we are at 183. We also are on the heels of a building project in which in, in a transparent nature, I want to have as much summer as I can for them. Um, but I also am not willing to compromise educational quality for the fact of trying to skirt in days or trying to f push through something. So it's just one that as we go and we're exploring and talking about it, what are some of the considerations? Yeah, I think the other stakeholders are probably the parents who uh, are fine with going to work three hours late going to work and leaving their students or the children home is, is another whole new uh, scenario. So uh, I think we better hear from the public too. Sure. Um, I, think, I think maybe trying one. I'm, I'm guessing we'll have at least an opportunity at, at some point <laughs> this winter to, to try this. <laughs> um, and I guess, so my concerns, the things that I would want to make sure are addressed, because I, I, we worked really hard to get those three, it used to actually be four, and we gave up one for PD. So if, if we're going to count one of these days as a teacher's work day, I want to make sure that there's real learning happening. So, um, so that's important to me. Um, I don't actually know, I don't think we are one-to-one -one all the way down through K. Yeah. We're only one to one. We've okay. Through second, yeah, through second grade, and I think some of those grades don't bring them home. So if you wouldn't know in advance mm -hmm. if it was 
snow was happening. I mean, so they have them at school, which makes sense. You don't have second or third graders. So, so um, there might be um, predictable snow days where we can send the te technology home because we, you know, they've said it's coming, or uh, you know, the project learning um, for the younger students. I think anything that we can do, though, that that continues instruction uh, through the winter um, is, is helpful because the more learning that happens during the school year before all of the spring testing, whether it's the SBAC or the AP or SAT, whatever it is, you know, the, 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 those days are more valuable to us than some of the learning that happens in June. Um, or it doesn't really happen in June. Sure. <laughs> no, I mean, I, the, a day is a day. I mean, those are valuable too, but I just feel like, so I think it would be worth trying at least one and reporting back because we do have three to play with. Um, that would be my vote. Sure. <laughs> well, my um, I guess, I, can you just talk to me a little bit about what that looks like? So when you say a digital day, are they gonna be working independently on their own? Or I mean, or is it gonna be a three hour session at home? I, I, I just, for me, don't really know how that, what that looks like. Mm -hmm. And I know it can vary from grade to grade, but I'm just kind of curious to know what that is. I mean, it can be a, a digital online community if people are doing Google Hangouts and talking mm -hmm. and working with projects. Um, it can be um, an independent project that is put out so they have to conduct research. They have to come around, synthesize some of that information, mm -hmm. however it's presented. Uh, whether they then share it in a Google Doc, the teacher can give feedback that day and suddenly it becomes a constructive working environment. So it could still be organized at home independently because I do think with parents and working and trying to maneuver around I, that. I, I, I agree with you. We are not going to, not trying to design it where this is a heavy intervention. We're also not going to try to make the parents the new teachers. I think uh, John, your statement is very well received. Is you know how are parents community feeling about it? Would they rather go into school to work three hours late, or is it already? It's not worth going into work. I'll just take the full day, and yeah. that very much should be reflective of our decision making. Mm -hmm. But to say to you, I think the idea of independent and applied mm -hmm. as much as possible. I recognize I'm not going to have our, our youngest learners go <laughs> freely onto the internet. Mm -hmm. um, it becomes very important that we have structures around it. What is the product right. that we're looking for for the outcome of that day? Mm -hmm. um, so it's, again, when I say it's in its infancy, yeah. it's one in which to even see if there's interest mm -hmm. in exploring is where we are tonight. So I'm going to say again, there is no digital snow day yet. <laughs> no, no, I hear that. Okay, thanks. No. Um, I just want to, to second your, your thought, Megan, about perhaps calling it something other than a digital snow day. Um, I think maybe project-based um, um, snow day or independent learning snow day, something, something like that. I, I think, not that I want to minimize the importance of technology and education, um, but if, if, we're, if we're having a snow day, typically the weather is such that, that there may be a problem with um, having internet access in general. And so if we've, we've got the, these elaborate plans for them to have a Google Hangout and they can't get internet service, which has happened at my home, I know on a number of really bad snow days, um, that, that could be a problem. So I'm thinking of it more as, as you mentioned, independent learning. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of it more as um, a packet that could be sent home. So Michelle was right, I think, about the idea that in New England rarely does a, a blizzard hit with no warning. Uh, usually we have at least 24 to 48 hours of some idea that there might be some hairy weather situations coming up. At that point, I think teachers could have packets that they've already prepared ahead of time that could go to, to each student that would allow them to maybe have some choices, that would allow them to maybe do some close reading that would allow them to kind of tie into um, um, so many other educational goals that we could all agree on that it would work even low tech. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm all for calling them E-days because then it doesn't imply that it's necessarily snowing because it could be raining or it could be a 
tornado like we had in the fall, you know, uh, or in spring, I mean. Um, so, and I think E-Days is nice and simple. There's school days and there's E-Days. Um, but on the other aspect, I think of, of, you know, once again, trying to find out how, without reinventing the wheel, even though it's a very new wheel, trying to find out how other school systems are doing it um, and, and learn from them first. Uh, because from what I understand, um, some schools have um, packets or as, as, um, as um, Michael alluded to that are prepared by the teachers and are e somehow either the day before in the hands or maybe they are digital and we're, we're presuming there's some kind of internet access or maybe they're loaded into their machines as they go home that night by 7 a.m. and then the assignments are all due by 4 p.m. and there's a certain amount of interaction possible with the teachers during the day. And then there are other districts, um, I think in Indiana or Illinois, I forget, um, that actually have virtual classes um, when they're at the high school level. And I don't know why we want to go that far because I can't imagine that, you know, being married to a teacher, teachers like snow days. <laughs> so being able to assign and kick back and then grade might be better than having them have to teach virtually all day. Um, but that's what I, I think basically being able to find out how it's working because there are three or four states where it's in practice and see you know, which one of those we might be comfortable with or adapting. Again, we are not doing this yet. I feel like I have to keep talking to the cameras, so we're not, but I appreciate everyone's input and so I can go and do some homework and report back. So thank you. Great, thank you. All right, committee reports. I'll kick it off with digital. We met uh, this evening. Uh, we have a list of policies regarding um, uh, data, data protection, copyright, uh, to uh, uh, privacy, uh, to breaches, security breaches, the list is is rather long. So we'll um, we're going to start to well, we prioritize those and um, and and continue to work them and bring them to the board uh, when they're ready to be brought to the board. What what we what we're seeing is that some of these subjects, for example, may be. Uh, in our existing policies today with, with a mention. And the subject has become uh, material enough where CABE has developed its own policy around that particular subject. So some of our policies may need to be taken apart, you know, and, um, and broken into uh, smaller people, well, not smaller, but uh, separate subject matter and creating policy, new policies were uh, dedicated to that subject like data retention. Um, privacy, uh, even copyright compliance now is a separate policy which we don't have. And I know we're observing the, uh, you know, the right practices to protect copyright, et, et cetera. Um, but um, anyway, it's, there's a lot of work uh, to just map which way, what do we need to do first, second, and third as we, as we just start to tackle these things. But we've got to start somewhere and we will. All right, uh, who's next? Michelle. Ed. Uh, we have not met since my last, is that right? I don't think we've met since the last time. I reported the last meeting. Okay, Michael. No report because uh, today is an education um, meeting and we've got three interesting, important topics to talk about today. Facilities, Greg. The Facilities Committee met tonight and uh, we spent the meeting with um, uh, Steve Rojek from Garland DBS uh, discussing the roofs on this building in Washington Primary. Uh, I can tell you that um, I had previously discussed with you the fact that we have an immediate need for a repair to the roof of this building. Uh, this is based on materials that were produced after Don had an infrared scan done of the building. We have some leaks. Um, we have some areas that are leaking. We have some areas that are wet. And if this work, if this roof is not repaired soon, uh, and by soon I mean immediately and forthwith, uh, we are going to incur a very great expense for a replacement of the roof. Whereas if we if we get these repairs done now before the winter is fully in full force, we will be able to. Uh, in the spring uh, and summer install a restoration of our roof at a substantially reduced cost from the cost of replacing it. 
just to remind you of those numbers, we had originally thought the number might be between $1.4 and $2 million, or $1.4 and $1.8, something like that, for restoring the roof versus $6 million for replacing it. So we were trying to save the difference between those two. And what, we had, uh, what Don had had um, Garland do is go out and actually bid out the work of doing these projects so we had real numbers in front of us. And so that's been done. And um, the repair work we originally had figured would cost $75,000. <coughs> the low bidder is at forty-seven two forty-five. So the repair work is about a little bit more than half the price of what we expected it to be. Um, that, uh, and the low bidder is qualified. They've done work for Region 12 in the past and done a good job on roof restoration work here. The restoration project which again we originally thought would be between a million four and a million eight or nine somewhere up there, um, the, the bid that came in was at a million four twenty four seven seven seven, and so that is at the low end of our of our expectation in terms of cost. That's a prevailing wage job. That's why it costs what it does uh, because it's over a hundred thousand dollars. It has to be bid at prevailing wage, and um, this work. If we were to go under contract for it before the end of December of this year, we would be able to lock in 2018 materials prices. And this would save us probably somewhere between 10 and 12 percent on the cost of the job. Uh, so it would reduce that million four twenty four number by, I don't know, maybe forty fifty thousand dollars 50000 net because this job was bid thinking that the town of Washington would waive the building permit fee. And we now know that that's not going to happen for a regional job. And that building permit fee is probably fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, somewhere in that range. Um, the other work that has to be done is Washington primary. We've got to repair, we've got to replace the roof over the library. It is substantially saturated. It's coming in from a porous w wall uh, going up to the second, top of the second story and that is allowing allowed water to infiltrate. That area we believe was dry perhaps a year ago and now it has been massively infiltrated from the heavy rains we had this summer. Uh, and so as a result that roof has got to be replaced. Uh, that is going to cost $99,000. Um, and then um, that will also repair one small little tiny wet spot in the, in the two-story building that, that they found with the infrared test. So we will be getting that under, under control. The good news of all of this is that we are getting ahead of the game now, and we are identifying problems before they become incredibly expensive, and it's going to have to be done. So I am going to, the Facilities Committee has voted tonight to request that the Board of Education um, entertain these three roofing projects uh, and enter into contracts this year so the work can be done this year. Now, uh, that begs the question of where is gonna money going to come from? but um, that's going to have to be worked on next. But we'd like to come back in early December and see if we can make some headway on getting these projects green-lighted. We have got to repair this roof. If you walk into the new teacher's area, you will see a leaking area that has destroyed several ceiling tiles. If we do not want to see all of this fine work we're doing to the building rendered ghastly looking, uh, we need to... Uh, we need to get going on this roof. So that's that's the status, and that's what Facilities Committee spent doing since the last time we met. Michelle? Um, just for the uh, finances, um, the $99,000 for a roof replacement, I would imagine, could come out of the capital reserve because it's a roof replacement. Do you know if the 47 and change needed for the repair could come out of the capital? I don't. I haven't looked into that issue. What I can tell you is, is that it is, is that that repair is a repair that has to be done before we do the re the restoration or resurfacing of the roof. So it's a, it's a, it's it's attached. It, it, it's something that that would. It's a separate project, but it's something that that we have to do. So I don't know if it can come out of capital. I'm. It sounds like it needs to happen this winter regardless. So I'm just kind of wondering if we're going to be scrounging around in the operating or if we can actually pull it from the capital reserve. Because there's plenty to cover both of those in the capital reserve right now. There is not enough, however, for the 1.424 and change um, restoration at Chapag that that, exe that that exceeds what's in the capital reserve understood so in order to lock that in I guess yeah we'd go to referendum we could do it 
you, you either going to have to put it to referendum or you're going to have to see how expansive the referendum that was approved for the uh, Ag STEM and Science Lab construction project, how expansively that was worded. Bob seems to think it was worded expansively enough. I'd prefer to go to a referendum, actually. Uh, but I think we, uh, what we can't do is we can't fool around with it because if we wait too long on that work, we will have bought a $6 million roof replacement because that, the, the surface of that roof is the pebbled surface of that roof, which is what's wearing out, is the only thing that keeps the sun from destroying the, the, the main layer of roof, the, the asphalt layer of roof underneath. And, once, and we already have breakouts in that, in that pebbled surface. So once a sufficient amount of the roof is destroyed uh, by ultraviolet radiation, the problem becomes you, you're into a replacement. You can't keep it. So this is not something we can put off for a referendum in the summer or the spring or around the time of the budget. This would be something we'd need to put to referendum pretty quickly. And in order to put it quickly, you need to educate people about why this has to be done. Um, and it has to be done because this building, we are keeping this building. Uh, and as long as we're keeping this building, we've got to make it watertight. And we are about to lose the watertightness of the building um, if we don't act on this. And we've known about this. The roof that's on the building is 19 years old. It's got a 20-year warranty. There's not much left that you would be able to get out of the warranty, even if you could. The warranty company believes, the roofing company believes that this roof is performing perfectly well and it's in the proper condition they would expect, which we do not agree with. And so we would be fighting over one, you know, a small portion of a warranty amount. It's just not worth the aggravation. And so as a result, what I think we need to do is we need to go about this a little different way. And one of the things we're doing, instead of the usual plan of having it spec'd out by an architect and then uh, we, it goes out to contractors and in the process of the way that whole thing works, everybody is a first, it's, a, it's a circular firing squad and they all point at each other when there's a problem. Here, what we've done is we've used, the way Garland bids this is what they're doing is they're asking people, they're asking these companies to bid. They got multiple bids, uh, from three and four, depending on which job we had. And these companies come in and bid their construction cost of doing the work. They don't know what the materials are going to cost because Garland provides the materials under, a, um, uh, uh, under something called, uh, uh, there's a, um, oh, I'm trying to think of the name of it now. Um, it, it's, um, Give me one second, I'll find it in my notes. They have, uh, they belong to something called U.S. Communities, which is a cooperative of school officials. And they, they have this, these types of contracts approved under that program. And so what they do is they then add their materials cost to each of the bid. The bidders tell them what they have to do to can do the, con you know, how, what the cost of construction is, and they tell them how much material they need. So Garland then fills in the material. So what you've got is the roof manufacturer. The manufacturer of the roof is basically working hand in glove directly with the contractors. There's no circular firing squad because they know what's necessary. They know the material we need for our building as opposed to some generalized notion of what some spec thinks. And they're the company that's been here working with us consistently over the years to, to deal with and repair our roofs. And so we're dealing more directly with the, with the manufacturer of the product rather than some kind of a thing where everybody's at different layers pointing at each other. T so we, we, we think this is going to be a much better thing, and we're going to have to get it done this year or the building is going to run into difficulty. All right. Stephanie? Sorry. Go Wait. ahead. I was trying to... Go ahead, Michelle. Uh, oh. Well, I... I, I I don't doubt that it needs to be done, and I, I trust the building committee to make that decision. And facilities. Oh, right, facilities. And you guys can worry all about the material and, and all that. I just am trying to get a sense of the finances and the timing. We can get the repair done before the winter. You want the res restoration in the spring? It probably, it probably will. They'll start doing certain things in the spring on weekends. Uh, when the school's not in session, but they're really not going to want to do the heavy work on the roof until the summer because it's not exactly odiferously pleasant. All right, so so it could go it could go to referendum with the budget, the operating budget in May then. Well, not if you want to sign the contract this year. I mean, the difficulty becomes 
I, I mean, I, I'm assuming at this point we're not, you, you're not thinking you're going to be in a position to sign a contract this year. And if that's the case, then you're not going to save the 12% that we could otherwise save by locking in this year's prices. See, they know what their material prices are next year, and they know that they're about 12% higher. Uh, so that, that, that's why this million four number is based on 2019 prices, not 2018 prices, because they didn't think we'd be able to get it approved in, in time. Um, so they use 2019 prices. So if that's the case, that's the case. Uh, you know, you're only talking about forty, fifty thousand dollar difference, um, but that's that forty or fifty thousand dollars would essentially pay for the repair work. So you see, you know, what ends up happening is you end up covering the cost of that if you can if you can move quickly, uh, and that and that's why I said we we need to look at various options. But um, uh, I mean, th this is not a question of of you know, of, of should we do it? It's we've got to do it, and the question is, how do we pay for it? And that's really, and I understand you're, and that's why I originally came to you a few months ago to talk about this, you know, because we knew this was this was coming down the pike at us, um, and now we actually have the numbers of what it's going to cost, and I think that puts us in the position of now knowing, one, that we're at the low end, in one case below for the repair work below our our original estimate. And in the major restoration work, we're at the very low end of our range. So, um, so you know, I don't know what to tell you, but we, we do need to get this approved, and I don't really want to wait till May because you won't be able to start the work in the summer. And remember, we've got an ongoing construction project at the school that has to dovetail with this. So Those parties have to work together because if they're drilling holes through the roof to put in HVAC units, that's not the time they, that's not the time they should be resurfacing that day. So these two projects have to be coordinated, and therefore we really want to get the answer sooner rather than later. And the other problem is, is that you know he, these budgetary, um, you know, fights that we had last year. The last thing we want is this referendum to get caught up in that, and then we lose a year, and then we lose the roof, and then we lose five million dollars. And that's what I really like to avoid, because people are very people can sharply focus on the reason why they don't want to do something. And they don't, you know, always appreciate the consequences of failing to act, whereas the board sees the numbers and does. But try explaining this and try explaining to people that if you don't, that we're trying to spend a million four to avoid spending six. So if we don't spend the million four in time, then we, we incur another four million four, right? And, and so at that point, you know, that, that's a hard thing for the average person to digest, but we have to get that, the public educated that Stephanie? that's what's at issue. Uh, we need uh, to move. Uh, Stephanie? And, uh, it's all right. Michelle followed up what I was going to ask regarding timing and where we are with that. So, um, Alan? Well, all right. It looks like we need to get going on it. So how long, how, how, what is it, 30 days for a referendum or 60 days? I think it's 30. <laughs> And when you're talking about this has to be signed in this calendar year by January 31st, is that it, to yeah, get that price? By December 31st. I mean, I'm sorry, December 31st. Well, then I guess we should probably start moving towards referendum then, because it doesn't seem like we have much choice in the matter. It seems like it's something that is obviously going to be somewhat stressful since our communities are just recovering from all the excitement of Ag STEM, but it's, it's going to be something we're going to have to work through. And obviously, the sooner we do it, the less of a ticket we're going to be presenting to our communities. We just have to, you know, educate them well and see if we can get this to happen. We can sign this in uh, the 19th of the 20th of December, or the last day of, of school or something. We, do we really have the time? I think, asking, I think expecting a referendum on this in the, during the round to Christmas time is really asking yeah. That's that's. People feel generous. Well, <laughs> Michelle, I think that's a massively heavy I, lift. I'm not. I'm not. That would be a question for Bob. I don't know that we can actually get a referendum turned around between now and the first of January, and I don't know that we are allowed to sign the contract if we don't have the funding in place. No way. No way. But but, I do think that moving a referendum forward. It, we should at least consider the, 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 the idea of, of putting it forward quickly, maybe in January, February, uh, and not confusing it with the operating budget, which will have agri-science in it for the first time. So um, just the farther apart those two are, might, I think, might be better. 
Um, it's not a huge, you know, we did the 2.3 million for the elementary repairs as a standalone once. Um, yeah, uh, that was part of, no, that was a separate one. So, um, you know, the fact that, that doing a quick repair on a roof, I think people can understand. Um, I, unfortunately, I don't see how we can get that t 2018 pricing, but we should still, I think, move forward. Oh, they, well, I, would, I would ask the vendor if they can hold the pricing good through the end of January and give us another 30 days. We can ask. I, I don't know that they can, but we, we can ask. L let me, uh, I want to suggest, though, on this that while I want to move quickly, uh, I don't want to move so quickly because he, once we once we vote to send it to referendum, we can't spend any money talking about it anymore. And so I think that what has to happen is we need. There's going to have to be a significant public education of, on this issue. We have to explain that the you know that there's a reason why the roof has to be re replaced periodically, and we believe that this would be a much less expensive alternative for getting a 20-year roof, uh, which we wouldn't get, um, uh, you know, we have to pay a lot more for to get a traditional roof installed and, and, and done. And I think that we have to explain that this will be a good solution that will save us a significant amount of money. And that's why we're recommending it. And because we need to do it now, during the time that the school's under construction and while we can get this done before the existing roof fails because the existing roof is is starting to show severe signs of, of wear and therefore we've got to do it. Uh, I know this is going to dredge up all kinds of things. People are going to say, why did you build a school with a flat roof? Decision made in 1969, executed in 1970. Now's not the time to talk about why we so built a school with a flat roof. So can we, so, what, so who's going who's gonna to leave here tonight and put together a schedule of events of what has to happen and when and how you want to execute this to bring this to the public? Well, I, l l l let me recommend that facilities work on, on a schedule of events of how to do it, but that finance work with the business manager to try to make sure we, can, we see what our alternatives are. Stephanie, and yeah, how you we shaking your head? Okay. Yeah, because we need to get this planned out. If we're going to, if this is the direction the board wants to go, we've got to get it planned out and start moving. And I do agree with you, Michelle. I think, you know, trying to, this is going to be a challenging budget year because this is the educational process of how the budget is going to look, and it's going to be dramatically different mm -hmm. um, than uh, what people are used to. And even that's going to require. Um, an education process of and in itself. Um, so, uh, g you know, getting these things too close together is going to be, yeah, it's, it's going to be problematic to say the least. Yeah. So, okay. Thanks, Greg. My pleasure. I think we just had five. <laughs> Kind of sound like we did. Um, yeah, we haven't met since the last business meeting, but um, yeah, should I say I can feel the excitement surrounding the budget season upcoming? <laughs> um, aside from meeting with Bob regarding the roofs, we are going to be, um, this is around the same time last year that Michelle reached out to the selectmen and the boards of finance. So. Uh, Megan and I are trying to coordinate our communications to speak with the selectmen first. Hopefully that'll happen in the next week or two. Um, and then head out to the boards of finance to either do individualized workshops with them, which might need to happen, <laughs> or um, figure out how to bring them into our process. Um, so we don't have to do so much of that side education that they can kind of be part of the process with us. Um, that needs to precede our internal workshops in February. So we're looking at December um, boards of finance meetings with Roxbury in Washington and Bridgewater will probably be in January because they meet every other month and um, they're meeting Wednesday. We won't see them in December. So a lot of kind of behind the scenes stuff coming up. Right. But we'll have more of the nuts and bolts uh, report next time. Negotiations, Greg? Yeah, we are currently in negotiations with uh, two unions. One of them represents our administrators, 
and the other union represents our paraprofessionals and clerical workers. So, okay. Policies. Um, we you met. Want to save for your actions, or <laughs> what? <laughs> I know you have two policies on here, so. But go ahead. Yeah. So. Well, I was just going to say we met tonight um, before this meeting, and um, we are are tackling a long list of policies that have been that require change due to the state legislative um, session that wrapped up I forget when it wrapped up sort of towards the end of the summer so um, so we're working on that and we are also starting to take a look at some of the um, bylaws and procedures of the board which are just uh, they haven't been touched most of them in 20 years uh, when they were adopted and they don't ever get triggered in our audits because they're not um, legal issues it's just practice and some of those practices have um, are no longer being followed they're they're outdated so we're going to start taking a look at those um, once we work through this uh, log of state required mandates thank you yep all right new topics worry I'm sorry oh I'm sorry I just yeah, jumped yeah, sorry, my finger moved too fast. Agri-science, agri Megan. Don't worry, Lori, I'll pepper them for you. <clears throat> um, but I do want to celebrate the um, work that was done for the Thursday, uh, November 15th, where we hosted a school luncheon uh, with Master Chef uh, Chris Eddy from the Winneman Farms and our agri-science students. Unfortunately, we know we had some weather impacts for our sending schools attendance. A lot of them had early releases that day. However, uh, we were able to take the information from that day, share it with them. Um, and I do have to say, I, I really applaud our sending schools um, attention to our project to make certain that they're getting our information out. Um, I'm working with a number of the sending schools to make certain the Chapog information is up on their website. Um, one of them had Nanawag, and thank you, Mike, for noticing that. And so as soon as we brought that to their attention, they said, oh, we'll take it right down, anything you want us to put up. So they are making certain that we have successes. So I do have to thank the superintendents and, and their teams uh, for the support that they're offering us. Um, I am expecting the first draft of our logo for after Thanksgiving, which will be used in our brochures and publications. And right now, uh, Kim Gallo and Lori Trovato are working on that along with um, our communications and publications team. So we very much appreciate the work that's being done. So right now, we really continue to just remain on people's radar. We are just not letting them forget, um, constantly talking to the guidance staff, constantly making certain that they get the information out. We recognize applications are due January 4th. It's coming up. We know it. And so we want to make certain that others are very aware of that date as well. Greg? Well, um, we're under construction. That's my report uh, on building. Uh, I don't know that there's anything in particular we, we need to cover. I think you're aware of the fact that we discovered we had a few memorial trees that had to be dealt with, uh, and we're in the process of dealing with that. Uh, of course, you realize when the first shovel was put into the ground, uh, the first thing they hit was an electrical wire. Um, and that, that electrical wire was not identified on a call before you dig. It was a wire that used to provide electric, electrical service to one of the memorial trees out by the uh, hill, and it hasn't in a while. And so, therefore, it was a, it was a non-issue and a non-problem, but it just shows you just when you think you've, you've saved all your contingency money, you hit a contingency. This one, of course, didn't cost us anything. Uh, we have approved our first uh, change order. Uh, for the project, um, and this is a change order which has actually caused us to save $60,000. Uh, so we have reduced the price of the project by $60,000 with, um, with that change order. And so we are proceeding, we are on target, we are under budget, and we are um, moving forward. So didn't you just sign something this week? Did we sign something this week? 
formally sign the uh, Oh yes, I'm sorry. I should have told you that. We we yeah, we did formally we did formally sign all of the we did formally sign and accept all of the bids for the work. So we are we are proceeding and that's that's why we put the spades in the ground because we had uh, we had uh, approved accepted bids. We signed a guaranteed maximum price uh, uh, which unfortunately doesn't seem to have made it into these materials. Uh, for you tonight, but we'll get that to you. We signed a guaranteed maximum price agreement uh, with uh, ONG uh, for a price of the project which brings us on target uh, for construction uh, to be at the number we expect and the state expects to fund. Uh, in actuality, that, we, that price also includes contingencies. ONG is carrying a million $1,108,000 contingency and we are carrying a now five hundred and forty thousand or five hundred and fifty thousand dollar contingency with the sixty thousand dollar savings that we uh we, and basically we saved that money because we were able to determine that a a less expensive sound attenuating structure around the emergency generator would comply more than comply with the zoning regulations and instead of having to have a level four containment facility which would have been very expensive we um we were able to get by with a level two, and that, that saved us $60,000 uh, on the contract. So those are the kind of continuous things we look for. Hopefully we'll find one or two more. Uh, but uh, bottom line is that added to our contingency. So we're still carrying the same guaranteed maximum price. That hasn't changed. The contingency is now greater that we're holding. So we, at this point, we have about 1600000 in contingencies, uh, and we feel comfortable that we should be able to get through the project uh, if we can finish the digging in the ground. That's where you usually hit things that cause your cost to escalate. You know, unexpected structures, unexpected ledge, uh, unexpected problems. So once we've done that, then we, we think we'll be in, in, in reasonably decent shape. And Greg, you were going to talk to us about the alt ads and uh, yep. what um, everything is. And there is a... Uh, There was I sent while well, you're looking for that email I, I, sent. It was November 12th. November 12th, and it is right. uh, a list called Exhibit B Alternates, October 26, 2018. This list, uh, the, these are the alternates. The first one, two, three, four, five alternates are alternates that we added to the guaranteed maximum price. That these are included. Um, we've accepted these alternates; and they've been included. So that includes the uh, athletic field improvements that will give us the second soccer field um, that we needed. Uh, that's a cost we had originally expected to cost $360,000, and then when we went out and did some analysis, ONG felt it was going to cost closer to half a million dollars, and it, the bid came in at $320,000. So uh, we, we felt that was one we wanted to proceed with. The north parking lot improvements, we'll actually have a proper base for that parking lot, and it will be, be done up to a, a better spec than we have now. And that you see the numbers for that in there. Um, the main parking lot, we we're going to carve a piece off of the, main, the far side of the main parking lot improvements in order to save money. We have now put that back. So that asphalt is back in. We were going to le leave it as a, as a crushed stone area to park, but we've now put it back in as asphalt. So that's, that's what that is. Uh, the north parking lot entry drive lighting, um, we have added into the uh, just newer new lighting for that area. We've added in at 98.5. Not going to try to reuse so much of the um, so as much of the old as we'd like. Um, Ductwork air return. This is the infamous duct that has given us so many problems down on the north end of the building. Um, you know, between having everyone extremely hot in the beginning of the school year and then everyone extremely cold following that. Um, we are going to be doing that air return now. And so that's, um, actually it's already been done. So that, that work is in. Um, the next group are called rejected altern alternates. We may actually do some of these, um, depending on how, where we come out in cost on the job. Uh, the air conditioning and dark room planning area is something we're gonna do. We really need to do that. And we're gonna try to get that in uh, before the job is finished. The outdoor equine riding ring I want to pass and come back to. The north parking lot entry drive. This, in essence, are several more light poles as you come on to the site. Our original light poles to the site, they're 25 feet high. They're no longer conf 
no longer conforming with zoning. And if we were to take them down and replace them with new poles, we would have to have poles that are only 15 feet high, which means we'd need more of them, and it, that costs an extra $113,500. So we're going we're gonna to remain with the ones we've got unless we just simply do extraordinarily well and have a lot of money left over uh, as we get toward the end of the job. Um, th there's three pending alt alternates. Uh, the interior wall finishes in the equine garage facility. This is actually a better wall finish than we, we were going to put a minimalist wall finish in there. Um, in order to save money, that was one of the, all, the value added adjustments we made. Uh, we're, we are considering putting that back in. Um, and this is an estimate of what the cost would be. It, ha it has, would have to be rebid. Um, the outdoor storage pavilion is something we'd like to have, and uh, it's about $95,000, and uh, uh, it, we're, we're still considering whether we're going to do it or not. I'm not, not sure how, what the fate of that's going to be. And then this thermal plastic membrane roofing is just a little bit better grade of roof and a very small area of roof. We're not 100% sure we're going to do it, but we probably will because the cost isn't very much. So that's, these are the adults. Uh, let me go back to the outdoor equine riding ring. We had rejected that because of cost, at $280,000. Um, what we're getting is we're getting the surface uh, is delivered to us of the area where this riding ring will be. We're not eliminating the area. That area will still be there. It will be delivered to us um, uh, with the proper grading. But what we would have to do is install underfield drainage and actually install the, the, the surface itself and the fencing around it. And that's what costs $280,000, the drainage, resurface, and fencing. And so that's something that we feel can be done either through the existing Ag STEM program or by raising money with grants, uh, trying to raise money for this, this uh, and to, to bring it online at some point in time after the school opens. Uh, if we have money left over, if we are flush, then this item would be considered. But if not, because we would have the, that's the kind of thing, you're not going to get money raised to put in a better roof. Okay, but you might succeed in raising money to add a facility, uh, the outdoor equine riding ring. So we feel that if we were going to put something on the priority list that is fairly low, this is, the one, this is one of the items that we would not take off the list first unless we were very flush. So that's the, that's the thinking and, and uh, behind why certain alternates were rejected and, and held. The other thing we have to keep in mind is, is that we are limited in the amount of change orders. Everything we do now is a change order. And we are limited to 5% of the project cost, which means we're limited to about $1.7 million or thereabouts. Um, in, all, in, uh, in change orders. And because we don't know what change orders may come up, we wanted to get as many of these alt ads in as possible, and so we've done that. So we're left with about 283. Uh, you've got about 470, 480 thousand dollars in rejected or pending alts, ad alts, and so that's within the tolerance. We may be able to get these back in by means of change order if we have enough money, and if we don't, if we don't use up our our, our reserves. Greg, sorry, I, I don't know if I missed it when you said it. Is there, there's a definition difference between alt ads and the change orders? Well, a, an alt ad is just simply uh, a project that we, in most cases, we had these things bid as alternates. Uh, in other words, the, the, the basic, there'd be a basic contract for some level of improvement, and then that, that contractor could also bid on this alternate so that we have the right to reject the alternate and or move forward with it or not move forward with it. And, um, and, and so they're not guaranteed that they're going to get that work, but, but it's bid as a separate item. We call it an ad alt. A change order is what causes the project to be modified to include a rejected ad alt. The only ad alts we've accepted are the first five. The rest are, for all intents and purposes, not accepted, and therefore the only way they could be done is by change orders. Um, John? I'd like to ask Don a couple of questions about the outdoor storage pavilion. What, um, it's my understanding that's where you're going to park the, the vehicles and the equipment for the, uh, the facilities uh, crew. Is that correct? No, sir. Um, no, the, the outdoor storage facility isn't the maintenance facility. 
What are you going to do with, without uh, a place to park the trucks? In our facility committee meetings, we've been discussing and we'll be continuing to discuss a place for the maintenance vehicles. So this <coughs> pavilion... John, John I, can, I can answer that question. What this is is that there are, there's several bins of material that they use in connection with landscaping uh, that, that's used by the Ag STEM school. And those are currently scheduled to be outdoors with tarps over the material. Um, we remove the, sh the, the, sh the structural pavilion around it to save money, and that was $95,535. So the question is, do we put that pavilion back in so that these things are under a well, roof? Is that pavilion sited? Yeah, it's, it's on the site. It's on the site plan. It's behind the equestrian center. Yeah, it's by the equestrian center, and what's there now is the area where the pavilion would go, and what's in it are the are the essentials of it, you know, the, the essence of it, which are basically these these three, I think there are three of them, the three areas that are formed by large concrete blocks. I think what people used to call mafia blocks. Um, and the idea was to build a structure on top of it, and that's what this is. So if we can get it back in, we'll get it back in. If we can't, we can't. Uh, so, so There'll be no place for the facilities to put their equipment. No, sir. Except outside in the yes, open. Sir. Hmm. Right. Any other comments, questions regarding the process, Michelle? Um, I, I think I said this last time, but I just wanted to quickly repeat that the outdoor uh, riding ring, I think, um, as a, as a part of the program and as part of um, what is exciting about what we're going to be able to offer, I'd like to see that get bumped up, um, obviously only if the funds are available, but I think it's much more important than having shorter lighting poles. So as long as the, the lighting is safe, um, I would move that one forward as, if, as, if possible. No, I don't, I don't disagree. We, we, we do feel the outdoor equine riding ring is, a, is an important feature on the project we would like to have. But when we were looking at uh, a substantial increase in cost due to the time this project took to go through, we had to value engineer things out. This became an obvious item to take out because we already have a, an indoor riding ring. So this would be a second riding ring. And while we would like to have it, um, you know, it, it's something that we, we couldn't justify having two of them um, because it would have meant taking other things out which could have affected program. And so that was, that was the reason why the, 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 the building committee decided to hold this one off on the side with the hope that we would find a way to get it back into the project before it's done. Sure. I haven't seen a site plan in a long time. It's, it's, there's turnout that is fenced in that is separate from the writing? Yes. Okay. Yeah, there's a turnout area, then there's this, this area where the riding ring would go, and then you have the equine center. I believe this is between the two of them, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I, no, and I, I agree, and I, I hear what you're saying um, about the, the program, so, and, and that is important, thanks. I, it's just, um, it sounds like a lot of ground moving, which I, I know after you've just finished a product project and gotten your grass to grow, to, to then go back in with trucks and and have to tear it up it's just um challenging and and but um we'll see hopefully hopefully we'll be able to add it back well in a, in a it is the single largest item in the in the rejected adults uh if we feel we reach if we reach a point where we feel that we are likely to have sufficient money to finish the project without going over budget and, and we have not expended our contingencies, and we have not had a lot of change orders in the, in the beginning part of the job. And once we're out of the ground and we no longer worried about what we might dig a hole and find, uh, you know, in the nature of ledge or some other problem under the ground, um, I think uh, at that point in time, we may feel the confidence to put these adults back into the project. Greg, um, what's the timing of this? When do you need, for example, when does the decision need to be made on the, uh, on the riding ring? I don't know the answer to that question. That's something I've asked ONG, and we'll, we should have that in time for our next meeting. Okay. Uh, to, to find out when the time, when we have to execute on these things 
so we know uh, where we are in terms of when we're out of the ground and we're at the point where we're starting to feel more confident, and then also where where these have to with the, when we have to pull the trigger for these. I think on uh, again, I don't know the process of making these decisions. Uh, you know, the thermal plastic membrane. I'm sure the board has a lot less interest in getting involved in that discussion and leaving it up to the building committee. But I think in something like the outdoor riding ring, it's such a, a, an important feature of the program that the board is going to want to make that decision ultimately um, as to whether or not it should be in and out and if it's, if, if it's going to be a, a, you know, an increase to the, to the project because it's outside of the state budget. I think that's something the board needs to decide on how important it is in the end. Um, you know, uh, to Michelle's point, to come in after the fact and then revisit this is probably the last thing anybody really wants. So it, it, I guess, Greg, would just leave the timing of all this kind of up to you as to well, when we need to make a decision? I will, I will report back to you at the next meeting what, what ONG tells me on this. My guess is, I mean, we're, we're sitting with a 500, and I think it's about just under $550,000 contingency, owner's contingency. This would be half of that. And I can tell you that ONG was not comfortable when our contingency was reduced to this level by other expenses and things that went into the, into the project. So I can tell you that they did not feel particularly comfortable with, with less than, than 600,000. They felt much better about four, 550 than, than they felt about the 470 we were at for a while. But um, I'm going to have to figure out when they're going to feel comfortable about us spending half of our contingency. Because that's what this is. It's half of our contingency. Um, and so that, you know, we, we'll, we'll do the best we can to get it into the program. And, you know, if you want to, and we'll keep you informed as to where we are. Um, I, ideally, to get this in the program and covered at 80 percent reimbursement by the state would be the way we'd want to go. So we're not looking to not spend the money. Yeah. I mean, I think we should spend all of the allotted money to get, to get these items back in the program, but the problem we have is, is we don't want to find some unknown thing that causes us to have to invade our owner's contingency. The ONG contingency is not tacked directly onto owners. That's in part to protect them from errors in the process or things that might have occurred with bidders that, that, that were not caught or, you know, there were things in there that, are, you know, we, they discover they're not producing what we need to have produced and it increases the cost. So th they're going to feel not particularly good about releasing their contingency to something like this uh, at the beginning. So I'm going to see how late we can pull the string on this to get it in the plan. My guess okay. is we don't have to pull the string immediately because this is something that's going to be if this work has to be done obviously the ideal time to install underground drainage is when you've got other underground drainage going in and that's going to be the thing that has to be done first um, as far as the fencing and the, and the surface that's not something that has to be done immediately uh, and if they know they're going to do that they won't plant that area uh, and so that that's something they can do much later in the process mm -hmm. so it could be that it's a two a two-shot thing right and they're gonna have to break it down as to how expensive it is for the drainage versus versus the surfacing and fencing and they, they have those numbers I'm sure I just need to get them from them and then we can say you know what we we don't feel comfortable on the full thing but we feel comfortable on the drainage and that will avoid our having to dig the thing up well, that sounds down prudent. the road yeah. so there are other ways we can play it and the, the building committee is trying to get every single one of these rejected and pending at alts into the project we're not trying to exclude them and say, hey, we came in under budget. Yeah, yeah. We're trying to get them in because 80% reimbursement, we're never going to get that deal. And so we really want to get that into the program at that level of reimbursement. I don't want to do it later when we have to cover 100% of it. All right. So we'll, we'll, we'll stand by on that. But, well, Julie, sorry. Just a quick question. Have we discussed yet or has anyone had thoughts yet on where the Diebold money would go, what that would be used for? No, we, we um, if I can jump, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, we being the superintendent um, and, uh, and Michelle, uh, the three of us talked about how to move this conversation forward. And it's time that we do need to move this conversation forward. Um, so, uh, Megan, I think you were, were going to reach out to, uh, to them to set up a meeting yeah. for us. And do you have a date? 
Uh, we don't have a date yet because Mrs. Diebel was traveling. Um, and so we actually, we want to make certain we also get a photo shop, a photo opportunity for them to have the shovel and everything else as well. So we're going to roll that into a meeting. So we will try back in a week and see if she's there. So, yeah. so we'll, you know, we'll keep the board, you know, uh, appraised of, of, of that conversation, that process. But we've got to get that going. So we've got that action actually uh, Megan and I have that action to uh, to drive that conversation forward. So, all right, let's keep moving. Thank you, Greg. Um, all right, now, Lori, it's your turn. Bob's not here. Even if he were, we'll move no, it on. Let's just move it on. We'll move it on. Yeah, no paper. No paper. We don't read paper. We don't read paper. <laughs> yeah, should have been in the package. Okay, great. I don't have friends. Okay, everybody. So um, I'm here tonight to. Are we? Are we ready? I just wanted to make sure. Keep going. Uh, okay. Uh, so I'm here tonight to share with you some exciting uh, news on our journey through the recruitment process. And the purpose of the presentation is to update you on our progress on reaching out to sending schools and recruiting uh, as the Chapaug experience through the agri-science program. So, so far, we've gone to six towns and nine schools. And we have two private schools that are forthcoming. So what I'd like to share with you is the numbers of all of the students that I have gone out to and talked to. And it's pretty remarkable. We've reached over 2,000 students approximately there on the board in Danbury, Brookfield, Sherman, New Milford, New Fairfield, and Newtown. Danbury having three middle schools of their own that we went to. Can you go back for a second? Absolutely. I'm sorry if I'm going too fast. No. Absolutely. So these numbers were taken off of uh, statistics that were found uh, via the online resources that we have. And, and this is approximation. What's the, since you've got this list up, what's sure. the status with Bethel? And have, are, are they still sort of in scope potentially for, for this inaugural class or? I'm going to defer that question to Superintendent Bennett. Bennett. Thank you. Um, at this time, um, Bethel is right now currently happy with Nanawag. However, we continue to have a, they want to see the success of our program, what we offer that's beyond um, what is offered in another school. So at this time, they are not included. Uh, as far as reach out goes, we are not pushing it, but we continue to have conversations and keep them aware um, for their central office on the activities we have and what we're doing with our agri-science program. I will say the schools that aren't up there that the numbers will uh, change is Washington Montessori has agreed to have us come do a presentation for them. And Rumsey Hall, they go up to ninth grade. And I have secured a meeting for next week, next Wednesday, to discuss the program with them in-house. Julie? Lori, I'm just having a little trouble with yeah. the way the numbers are lined up. So what's the 33? That's a low. What? What is? Yeah. That? So, so that number there is Sherman School, I believe, on the board. So they're a very small school. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions on this slide? Okay. Sure. Yes. With West Side Academy being that it's a STEM school. How was, um, how were you received in terms of the students? We gave three presentations that day. And I have to tell you, it was pretty remarkable to see the students all sitting there and going through three times. And all three times, it was the same type of response. They were excited. They were engaged. And with the video I'm going to show you at the forthcoming soon, I show a, a, a video that is put out on all of my presentations. And the students, I have to tell you, they are really grasped by the idea and the concept of it. And it really makes me feel really happy. So 
and I will share that with you. I actually have it embedded in here because the students, they receive it so well. You can see the look on their faces by the enthusiasm, by the questions, by the clapping. And it comes naturally when we're in the when I'm in this conversation and I talk and then I show this presentation video, all of a sudden, like the first time it happened, I was like, wow. And the students just started clapping. And I did not expect it, to be honest. I didn't. And right there in middle school, they have a lot of decisions to make and where they go to their high school. So to say the least, I was very pleased and look forward to more to come. And after the presentations, there's always seems to be an uprise in phone calls and emails from, from parents and guidance counselors with questions. So with the program allowing ninth graders to also come in, we're making sure that we are reaching out to the schools and our in-house students as well. So our in-house students have already had a presentation of the agri-science program and the offerings. We've also made sure that through conversation via on the phone and in person with the guidance counselors of the sending towns, because they know who their students last year that were in eighth grade that are now ninth graders that may be interested in this program, have the opportunity to potentially apply, are aware of that. So we've made sure that we've sent applica an application to them and the presentation because we are not made to go, the, the high schools will not allow us, they don't have to allow us in. So at least this way, the guidance counselors at the middle schools can share it with students that they know. I've had those phone calls. I know of a student that may be interested. They don't give names, but they tell me. So we've shared this so they can get the information out to them. So we have also uh, sent invitations to the sending school school counselors to make sure that they're aware of the introduction and welcome uh, ex to the orientation to the Chippewa experience that's now forthcoming. It was a rescheduled event due to the snow for November 27th at 7 o'clock. So that was put in there as well. So this is the video I was referring to and I will show it. It's, it's brief but it paints a picture to the students and it's impactful, and the students really well receive the information that's in it. And it really shows what we're going to have in our program. It was a time when about a quarter of all Americans were engaged in agriculture. A time when many farms still operated without electricity. When a short trip to town actually meant a pretty long ride. Times have changed. And agriculture has changed, offering new opportunities and careers in fields like business, education, production, and research. That means FFA has changed, too. FFA makes a positive difference in the lives of students by developing their potential for premier leadership, personal growth, and career success through agricultural education. We're strengthening American agriculture and providing our members with the skills needed to build healthy local communities, a strong nation, and a sustainable world. Today, less than 2% of Americans are engaged in production agriculture, but our membership is at an all-time high. And as we've grown, one thing has come to represent the pride we have in our organization. It's not a song or a slogan or a flag. It's a simple blue corduroy jacket. Without it, I'm just one person. 
just one voice. But with it, I know that more than half a million others have my back. That more than half a million others are helping me tackle some of the world's toughest challenges. Like feeding the world, stewarding our natural resources, and finding solutions for agricultural sustainability. And we're doing it together. With the help of our families, our teachers and supporters, we are learning to do, doing to learn, earning to live, and living to serve through our local chapters and state associations and at our conventions and conferences. By becoming thought leaders and advocates for what we know is right. We are the next generation of agriculture, committed, passionate, and proud to be among those who feed the world. Powered by our spirit, guided by our mission. Symbolized by a simple blue corduroy jacket. We are the next generation of agriculture. It's our turn now. Let's show the world what we can achieve together. We are FFA. And then the applause just, just naturally comes from the student audience from, from that presentation piece of the event. So we're making pioneers, right? These, are, these students are going to be pioneers to sustain our world. And that is something that I'm really proud of to share with them when I go to the presentations. So I've, I've shared, I have an, a handout that I believe you all have uh, at your table that we provided to, at the luncheon that the students worked at to create the meal with Chef Eddie from Winvian, and it was a remarkable experience. And we made sure that this was, these questions that were commonly asked questions were shared, and I wanted to make sure that you had a copy of what was answered in case you had any questions, they're there for you to see and peruse at your own leisure. If you have any questions, you can by all means let us know. In the essence of time, I'm not going to go through all of them that are there, but you have the answers in, in front of you. When are the applications due? January 4th, they're in due in-house. The guidance counselors, excuse me, the school counselors at each town school to have their own in-house date because there's many pieces of the application that they have to put together to get us the full packet which I'm going to go over briefly here and I've also provided you a copy of the application packet there that the students need to get back to their school counselor and then into our hands for further review so there is a link on our website to the application in case a student loses their application. It is there on our website, and I did put a link in this application uh, presentation, so I will share that with you. The summary of it is the student has to complete their pathways of interest. They have to give their personal information. A wonderful and important piece is their student essay because we really get to start to see who this individual is their student records, and the three recommendations, which the school counselor has to do, a teacher has to do, and a non-relative has to actually fill out. So there's many pieces of this pie in order to have this come together. And the due date is similar to others around the state. So in November and December, we will have an ac application review committee that will be put together. We have the... Uh, list up on board, the Agri-Science Committee will be Principal Gallo, Associate Principal Lori Ferrara, myself, a uh, Chapog School Counselor, and a Chapog Educator to be determined. Of course, January 4th, the applications are due in-house. Then the review and interview of potential candidates will commence in January and February. In February, acceptance letters will commence. So, are there any questions? So we'll get our first view of uh, potential interest January 4th? Or the, will you get something early, will you get a preview earlier than that? We may. We're in constant contact with the school counselors, and there's been a lot of interest. I just got an email today asking more questions 
about things that they needed to provide to us through testing and the letters from the students themselves. So there's, there's a lot of interest. I wouldn't doubt that we may see some beforehand, but I don't want to guarantee that because January 4th is the due date. They'd give that due date so the school, then the Christmas break happens and they have some time to compile everything <coughs> because there are so many pieces of the, of the pie that have to happen. If, as soon as I have some preliminary numbers, I'll let you know. Michael. Um, great, great video. I, I think I, I can see why they would get excited by, by looking at something like that. I'm just wondering if, um, as part of your presentation, the road show that you've been on um, at many different locations, are you showing a specific video that highlights Chapog itself, too? So I don't show a Chapog video at present. We are working with Colin to compile because this is a work in progress, right? We're creating this from the grounds up. So we have been working. But what we do show is a presentation. So the presentation talks about our program and talks about the agri-science experience and what the Chapog experience would be through conversation. Okay. But there isn't a video yet, but we have had, we have been pulling together pieces. That would be great because we have so much to offer that I think would be visually appealing and I think that would be a natural segue. Um, are, are students able to go on to, like do you give them information about our website, for example, so that they could so, be experiencing it that way? So the, guide, the, the school counselors themselves, I send them the links to our website. I also send them the site plans, the pathways. So I make sure that I embed those right in my email conversations after we have the phone conversations. So they expect them coming. And I ask them to share them with the students. Right. And they have the presentation in hand in case the students also want to get that. Loy, I'm going to interject for just one second. Sure. Also, Mike, just so you know, um, part of the video that we are creating right now about the Chapog experience, which has been under the guidance of Ms. Gallo and, uh, and Colin, has been getting our students to talk about what the future looks like, getting them to talk about their Chapog experience, talking so much and getting to see the excerpts of things that our students really highlighted. It was feeling belonging. It was feeling accepted. It was right. feeling that they are part of something bigger here at Chapog, and this would be lost at a larger school. Um, the other thing that I thought was wonderful was we had students from Sherman who talked about mm -hmm. the difference in coming here and why they chose to go. So Colin's splicing that together in order to make certain that we can for future um, put that on our website, take that on the road show, so it yeah. is all under construction. That will be wonderful. Um, the last question I had was um, so much of, it, of the, the application process seems to really fall on the students themselves with obviously support from their counselors at the respective schools. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, what place parents play in the application process. It, it seems like, you know, thinking back so long ago to when I was in eighth grade, they pay, played a huge role in kind of guiding me into programs that they thought would work for me. And I'm just, I'm just wondering if you've had any direct calls from parents who've heard around about the program, either through a news article or just word of mouth, and um, if there's any way we could continue to foster parent excitement and involvement in, in, in the process. Sure, so believe it or not, the students are going home to their parents excited, and I am getting phone calls right after the presentation happens, within a day, from parents. Please tell me more. That is the first question usually out of their mouth please tell us more of what this experience is going to be like here. And the conversations are quite long. <laughs> they are not short and brief. Uh, I've been on the phone at least sometimes a half hour to 45 minutes with one parent at a time because the parents really want to understand why am I leaving, say, Danbury to have my student go to a totally different town that's not five minutes away. And the conversation is really about my students really, my, my child is very excited about this idea. Tell me more. We have invited those parents to come to that night on November the 27th. So they're able to come and actually see us in person and learn about not only the agri-science program, but the Chapog experience. Because that night, there is a lot, of lot on that itinerary that has to do with the Chapog experience as well. So we will have that contact. Once the applications come in play, and we have them. We will have. Well, we know what our 
student roster looks like, potential student roster, then we can keep fostering that relationship with them. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Any further questions? There was uh, an expectation, I believe, that rising ninth graders at Nanawag from our sending towns would have an option of, of coming to Chapag instead for 10th grade and beyond. Can you say that one more time? I'm sorry, rising ninth graders that are at Nanawag? Current ninth graders at Nanawag from these sending towns yeah. would have um, an option of coming here f to complete yeah. their program. So as far as I understand, it's grandfathered in, and I'll have Megan take over that, the answering of that piece, because my understanding is if they're already there, they would stay there. They uh, wouldn't Superintendent transfer over. Uh, what we're offering is any student who wasn't accepted into Nanawag. So if it's a potential ninth grader who is from one of our sending towns, was not accepted into the Nanawag, we would take them as a 10th grader. However, they are able to, if they've already been accepted into the Nanawag program, continue to their graduation from Nanawag. So what we're working on are the students who are ninth graders at this time, rising 10th graders, who may have been interested in agri-science before, and we're letting them know if they're still interested, they can apply. So for us, it's any new agri-science student would be considered for Chapak. So that would be our, wait, our infamous wait-listed students? That's correct. Okay. Thank you, Superintendent Bennett. So that's why the sending school counselors from the middle schools, they know who those ninth grade students were that were waitlisted that did not get the opportunity to be at Nanawag, and we've had conversations with them to ask them to please kindly reach out to them so they could come and potentially be a part of our world. Okay. Any further questions? Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Next on our agenda is uh, Z Space Experience. Teresa? Good evening, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving to you all. And to just um, fire things up, I'm going to ask you to come and join me at the Z Space stations because there is a station for each of you. So just to fill you in a little bit on Z-Space, it does take a little while for the programs to come up, as you noticed. Sometimes it seems like it freezes a little bit, like it's glitchy. Um, so when teachers bring a class, they know that they probably can't spend every moment doing everything that they were expecting because there are these like technical glitches that occur. The other thing is the motion sickness. I have heard that from multiple people um, who have that sensitivity, so we're mindful of that. And there is a binder. Teachers have to um, sign it out because all the um, apparatus we don't leave it out here, it goes into a bin and then it comes out when it's needed and then it goes back into the bin so a stylus doesn't disappear or walk, anything like that. Uh, so the teachers right now are really exploring with the students. Um, we're finding that there is um, a ceiling of how much it can do. Like once you've explored, you've explored the heart, it's not like there's a level two or a level three per se. You've you've maximize that. So we're trying to really determine how deep can the other apps go and how beneficial and how frequently is it being used. And we did have all the math and science teachers trained. We had a trainer come in um, during one of our PD days to spend time with them so that they would know what to expect when the kids would come. So it's getting use. We're monitoring. We're encouraging. But we do want honest feedback as to how it enhances learning for the students. 
And so that's the information I'm gathering. Thank you. You're that welcome. Was, that was really fun. I just wanted to say that I think there is probably some value in just exploring the technology itself. Mm -hmm. You know, even if the student isn't using it for a class, but to have experienced the interactive uh, nature and what's possible so that as they go out into the world, they, they can, will have had that experience so that they know what technology is already exists so that they can help think about what the future, you know, what's next after. So that. what you're saying is providing opportunities that aren't bounded by a classroom setting, mm -hmm. but to have students be able to experience the, it. Yeah, I, I for the sake of the technology, yeah. just in and of itself, outside okay. of anatomy or, or, or whatever, at least while we've got the technology here, if it proves that it's not, because I think we're on a pilot. We are, we are piloting okay. it this year. Okay, so, but it just seems to have some inherent value that way too. Thank you. Yes. Well, it certainly has has a novelty value, which will you know yes. keep you happy for a little while. But I, I I would be concerned with the level of sophistication that it can reach, and I'm sure there is more. But it is a little bit, um, you know, the experience is kind of like I don't know what, like first time I saw a computer or something, I was like oh wee, and then right, and, it's, and it, it is a very, very elementary reaction, and then we have to get to a a high school reaction after a while. But what I'm wondering though, whether Colin or Vic or anybody has looked into. Um, whether the uh, actual uh, interfaces have enough memory in them, because it seems like that's the lag, um, unless it really is entirely cloud-based and there's a transmission delay. But if it's not, if there is, if there are brains locally, then I think the reason everything takes so long, and it, it's not so much the loading in, but it's the reaction to the stylus. The delays are confusing, and that so might so we don't control that, right? right? You might that the whole system came from. Z space. But you might want to give them feedback that right. they appear to be underpowered as far as memory goes, because, and that's the lagging in the reaction, right. which can I think can dampen the... Right, because you're sitting there patiently waiting. Or thinking you've, you're, you're going too fast or too slow, or you're waiting, or you, you know... Right. You might want to give them that feedback. Okay. Yes. Can you get like a really big screen, one stylus, and lots of 3D glasses? Is this something that has to be manipulated by the student? Is there really value in it? That's one thing I'd like to know from your work. Is there really value in playing with the heart? Or would it be better to have the heart played with by someone that knows the physiology of it? You know, what are we really using this for? Are we using right. it just to play? And if we're using it just to play at $2,000 a seat, that's what it costs. 10 seats, $20,000 mm -hmm. one that's year. Correct. Uh, that's a pretty expensive toy. Right. And so so the, the, the question is, is how are we using it? How could we better use it? Right. There is a teaching station. The one on the end here that has a camera that stands out is different than the others. And um, by having a screen behind there, it can project so that you don't need the 3D glasses. So that has been utilized as well. Well, that's all fine and good, but I think if you're going to use it in a classroom setting and you're not going to have individual people at consoles, you want something to project onto a larger s screen so that people can see it from a distance because they're not going to be sitting with their head in the screen. Right. You know, I I if, that if that were a viable use for this or if there was something similar on the market that could allow you to... I mean, I can see the value of teaching anatomy with a heart that is exploded. I mean, you literally can, can take it right. apart and, and look at it and look into it. I can right. see a tremendous advantage to that. I'm just not sure it needs to be the personal advantage. And how many times will you repeat that same experience? Right, that's what we're really looking at. How deep can we go with what we have? Well, if, if, that, if all the deep you can go with it is what we saw here, right. I, it's not worth 20000 No, there are separate apps that they go into. That was just um, sort of like a teaser where you went to drop in the butterfly, to drop in the heart, but then there are separate apps. And, and so I guess that would be one of my questions too. You know, as an English teacher, I'm always thinking of text that would meld with the, you know, great manipul manipulatives, great visuals. Um, and certainly there are a lot of students who need to learn using that right. method. Um, but I'm wondering, do they also give, like, for example, the heart module that we were looking at, if I, I would love to have like the left ventricle where I, if I clicked on it, I could also get a text box 
that would visually, that would in text describe the left ventricle and the function of the left fun ventricle. And um, I'm just wondering if... You give me a lot of feedback to provide if, Z space. If they have, yeah, if they have that, I mean, they should be able to, there's so many great probably websites right. that do exactly what I'm talking about already right. that they could probably link to um, and have, they even have like a little, they could have a little movie screen that it comes up on there so that they could have a video that was showing or they could have text scrolling on the bottom of the video or right. they could have, you know, the heart, like, yeah. you know, right now it would, if you clicked on it, it would show you on there but um, you could probably have an auto selection right. where it would do it for you rather than Certainly. you having to. So I'm just yeah, absolutely. thinking about that, that text option too. Okay. Well, I hope you enjoyed. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> no promises, Brown. All right. <clears throat> well, it's good to see you all up here. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm going to transition us from ZSpace to talking about our AP scores. Um, and this is where I do not want the board to be shy with your questions. We recognize the information we're providing is not where we want to be. We recognize that when people are researching our region and our school system, some of the information that comes up does not showcase all the greatness that we house here in the schools. One of the stats that I absolutely love about this school is when you look at how many of our graduates cross the stage, go on to college, and then graduate from college. That's a wonderful statistic. It comes up to about between, it depends on which year you're looking at, but between 85 and 89% of our students. Great statistic. It took me a little over an hour to find that statistic. Turns out if you go to trendct.org, you can find that. But that's not what is readily coming up when you look at Chipog. And so what we have to do is we have to make certain that we're looking at how are we showcased and what comes up. And if we are not showcasing our best side, what are some of the things we can do? What are some of our learnings? Because we're not going to be defined by a test. However, if that starts to give our first story, we better make certain that we are holding on to our narrative and where we want to take it. So I looked up our US News and World Reports because we were really excited. We had made it one year on to the best high schools. And we are an honorable mention. And so there were four criteria that come up when you look at what it takes to be on this report. So the first one is your state proficiency on the areas of math and reading. So that would be for our younger grade levels considered our SBAC. But when we're looking at our high schools, it really is looking at our SAT scores. Our graduation rates, which continue to be something of pride. We also look at the historically underserved students that are performing above state average. So our students with a minority distinction, students who have a special education label, those who have free and reduced lunch. But today what we're looking at is that fourth criteria, which is the amount that the schools prepare students for college level work through co college level courses offered. That is our AP offerings. So part of that statistic is, is they look at the amount of 12th graders that you have and how many of those 12th graders have taken an AP course during their time. Well, thanks to you, we're very proud of the offerings that we have at Chipog that allow students who t may not have gone on to AP courses to try, to try the experience, to get into a class that may interest them. And this has come at a cost. It, it is one in which we recognize every time we introduce a new AP course, there's training that's involved. We send our teachers to Taft. There's books that are cost, so usually about $150 a book. And I know some people who say to me, textbook, no. There's a requirement that if it's an AP offering, they have to provide a textbook. 
So those are all costs accrued. And these are investments we give to our students because we know we want them to have that experience. So when you look at the meanings of AP scores, what they state when you go on to the College Board is that if you receive a five, you're doing extremely well. That would be equivalent to an A plus or an A in that college class. A four, very well qualified. So you're getting low A, high B. A three, you've qualified, so between a C and a B minus. A two, you possibly qualified as far as concerning that a college rigorous achievement. And one is no recommendation. I share this with you because now I'm about to share with you when we break down our Chapog scores. Right now, 53% of our students are scoring a three or higher. 53% of our students would be considered getting a C or higher on a college level class. And we recognize this is where it is incredibly important that what we're also recognizing is that percentage score is that we have 102 students that sat for an AP exam. 102 students. 54 of those students scored a three or higher. That is information that we have to, because we've also made it a requirement that our students, if you are trying the AP experience, that you sit for that AP exam. Some of the students who are stretching beyond what would be their comfort zone are still trying, are still trying that course, are getting that experience and sitting for that test that may be just beyond that reach. However, I do not want to say that that means they have failed. We have set the foundation for when they may take that course when they go into college. But it is important that we are not giving our students a false sense of security. It's important that we get them to recognize, here's what this means. When we sit down with students and we're offering and saying, maybe you want to go into English Lit. Maybe you want to try this at an AP level. We need to make certain those students recognize the reading demands. We need to make certain they recognize the writing demands, the research demands that are out there. That this is not just the typical course where you come into your high school class and the teacher is the provider of the content. The expectation is, is that you are consuming the information so when you come into that classroom, it is a richer conversation, that the discourse, that the conversation is elevated because when you go to college, it's not just about facts and memorization. It's about how do you take that information and manipulate it, make it your own, tease it out, challenge one another. So for us, what's important and what we're currently looking at is making certain our AP courses are not being seen as an honors level high school course. It's a college offering that we're providing here within the high school. It's a wonderful opportunity for the students to have this experience, but we also recognize when we're looking that right now, our students are getting approximately a C in some of our courses. In some of our courses, not even that. And so what becomes important is that we have to take a look and we have to say, what are our practices? What is happening at Chapog that starts to say, why are we having these results? So the first thing, and again, this is not going to change. All students are encouraged to take advanced placement courses. We also recognize that students will take that AP exam when placed in the course. However, students who elect to take the AP course for an ECE credit, that UConn credit we offer, do not have to sit for our AP exam. This also means some of the students who are taking this for what would be UConn credit are not sitting for our exams. Are we also putting ourselves at a disadvantage because some of the students who may see this as putting in the college effort, they're going for that UConn credit, are not sitting for this exam. 
So we also have to take a look at that when we're talking about changes that may be necessary. We also have where students can withdraw from an AP class within the first two weeks of the school year. Well, that means that is the moment that you have walked in and realized either you didn't do your summer reading like you were supposed to, or the syllabus looked really hard. But most students don't really get into the rigors of the course until much deeper into the coursework. And so at this time, they are locked in the class. We are working through those challenges. So we've got a two-week window in the event that it may have been a wrong choice. It may have been a stretch too far. There's a difference between a frustration and a challenge. We always want to challenge our children. We are not looking to put them to the point of frustration. So we put forth our goal. And for our goal in 2018-19 school year is 58% of our student will achieve a three or higher. I'm embarrassed I wrote 58. But when we look at right now, our starting point from 2018 is 53%. We're going to get incrementally better. But it is also making certain that we are teasing out the appropriate variables. This is not about changing everything. This is about taking a look at what is our current practice. This is sitting down with our leadership team to say, what is happening that is working in the classroom and what is not working? And so we have questions. Are our students ready for that AP exam? Are we providing the coursework that brings them to the challenge that the AP exam provides for them? Do our current exams and scoring let students know how they're going to do on the AP exam? If I'm getting an A in that class, I think I'm walking in like I'm going to get that five. And yet we're not seeing that happen right now. And so we also have to look, are we getting that predictive data early enough in order to allow students the intervention and support they need? Are they knowing when they have to go for that extra help, when they have to seek that information? We also want to make certain that students are trying it, but when we say that, are we also coaching the students? Should all students be taking that, or should we be directing them to certain courses? And this is the work that our guidance counselors do on a regular basis, but make certain that they're given the reasons why. Are we looking at their historical data? Or are we just saying, well, you haven't tried an AP. Which AP do you want to try? I don't think that's happening. We tend to map it out. We tend to be more thoughtful. But we also want to make certain that the students walk in recognizing the challenges before them. We also want to look at what is our teacher preparation process. What are the ways that we're training? Right now, we send them to Taft for a week. We have some updated, they get some professional development, they work, they have our curriculum director they can reach out to. But also looking at, is there something beyond? What are we doing so they feel secure in their content? These are high school teachers who are also stretching into college level work themselves. And how do you bring that rigor up? And there's a question of why is there a variance between right now our virtual high school and Chipog AP exam scores? We recognize that. When we go back to our scores and we see that right now we have a 3.392 when it's VHS versus the Chapog taught is 3.2. That also hides a lot of information. The students who are taking the virtual high school classes typically are the ones who are seeking certain types of information. There's already a commitment to that content. They may already know their concentration. There's a vested interest versus some students who are trying an experience. We're not going to put somebody who's trying to just get an experience onto virtual high school. We want them to have that interaction. We want to be able to watch and monitor. But it still becomes part of our question, and it's something that we're looking at right now. So <clears throat> as we're looking for some changes in our current practice, these are some things that right now we're exploring. This is not an all extensive list. There are certainly things that as we start to uncover other questions, but our questions right now are taking us towards some of these potential changes. So one of them is, and this actually came from Lori Ferreira when we were having the conversation at our admin retreat during the summer was, well, 
what if we allow the students to be excused from just one AP exam during their high school career? Now, with that said, it would not be haphazardly chosen. They would have to consult with their teacher. It would have to be signed off with their counselors. We'd have to make certain that we're looking at the, the reason for why this is exemption. Some students may be taking a five AP course load, and we say, hey, that feels like a lot to prepare for. Maybe we only take four of those. Or it could be that student who really stretched themselves. And we say, you know what, it was a great experience. And we saw you worked really hard. Let's practice some of those AP exam test questions. And if you're not ready, it was a great experience. So doing some counseling with that, making certain, but to allow that exemption from one that may not even be exercised, but maybe at least an offering may help us to reflect what's actually happening in our schools versus making it look like only 53% of our students are achieving at a college rate. Review our courses that are not meeting standards. There are some courses that right now have historically not produced the results we would like them to. So we're gonna be looking at some of those curricular needs um, what are some of the instructional supports and also the possibility of removing that offer. It may not be the best course to continue forward with. And if we do remove a course, what are we going to change it out with because we do not want to reduce the offerings we have. We are a small school. But that's one of the things that keep people coming towards us and one of our sales points is that we have AP offerings that meet their needs. So our honor roll, uh, our honors courses right now, some of them are being offered concurrently with the AP offered courses. In the event there's a decision two weeks later that AP was not meant for us, giving the children a little bit of latitude. It's not offered at all courses. I'm going to tell you, I think I've been reminded about 50 times so far that scheduling's hard at a small school. <laughs> I'm going to tell you it's been a slow week. Um, so to say to you, it's important then what are we offering to our students that we're not locking them into a potentially bad situation for themselves. Again, there's a difference between frustration and challenge. Um, having parent meetings. And in talking, we already do that coursework where we talk to the parents and we say, here's how you map out your child in eighth grade what AP offerings you want to get them to, and we kind of do some backward mapping and how you get them into that course, but also making certain that we're sitting down with parents as the time gets closer and saying, wow, your child is involved in how many extracurricular activities? Your child is already taking how many AP courses? We're not looking to break children, but it is important to say, hey, that C that you got in Algebra two." probably is not calculus material, and that's okay. But you know what? If you really want to do some reading and you want your, your last research project we saw you do, it would be a much better idea for you to take English Lit at an AP level. Those are the conversations we want to make certain are regularly occurring because that roadmap that's sent out in eighth grade is not always the crystal ball for what's going to happen throughout their high school career. So providing those opportunities, and I know what happened was is those were provided early on, and then we have word of mouth. We have nice spread. However, it becomes important that we reintroduce that, and that continues to be on the landscape for parents and their awareness when they're choosing these courses. We also talked about, and this is one I'm going to say to you in very strong terms, we have to talk to the teachers union about this. But I do think that it's important when most students finish their college level course, students do a survey for their professors, giving feedback. Now in a college that typically goes to the department chair and dean, et cetera, we're not looking for that. But I think it's important our teachers get a feedback on what was that experience like for the students because those grades don't just tell the story. It's not because I got a kid an A that I did a good job. How does the student, when they're reflecting on that experience, sometimes a B that you fought really hard for, that you were coached all the way through, speaks greater to that teacher's ability than an A that may exist on a report card. And so giving some of that, uh, some of that subjective data, allowing for that opportunity to have conversation is important. 
and for us also looking at professional development opportunities. We want to make certain that we're providing, we look at other districts. Some of them in their advanced placement are doing remarkably well. We want to make certain we're giving our teachers the opportunity to learn. This is not just about our students being learners, but them recognizing we're all learners and how can we improve upon. So this is really the start of this conversation. This is something that we're going to come back to as we make these changes, as we can start to say there's predictive data we're starting to see. Today we did an exercise with our um, department heads that Teresa had led. And we had them look at all of the grades throughout a year and make some assumptions on how you think those students did when they were sat down in front of that AP exam. And I can tell you what we heard and what they're wrestling with is some consistency. What we heard when we listened to them wrestle with is when do you get an A plus on a formative because you completed the assignment versus you get an F because you didn't complete the assignment. Where's the meaning in that? And Teresa did put in a teaser. So we're going to follow that up with actually giving them what those actual results were at our next meeting. But really what we want to see is if there's a disconnect between what we're seeing when the children sit down to take that test and what we're experiencing in grading in the classroom, how do we make those tighter aligned? And again, this is not about a test. This is about an AP experience. And we want to make certain that the richness that we're giving, it gives them truly a preview of what's going to happen to them in the years beyond Chipotle. So I ran out of things to say, mm -hmm. but I'm hoping you have some questions or things that you're thinking, because at this time, what I'm going to say to you is it shouldn't be OK that we're just sitting here at 53. We've got places to grow, and I'd love to hear some thoughts you have on how we can grow. Julie. I had two questions. One was the decision not to make the kids taking the UConn class to take the exam. What was the theory behind that? I have a hard time speaking to the history of that, mm -hmm. um, but I do believe um, it was because of the fact that they are working with a rigorous program, it is, they're going to get UConn credit. Because AP scores are what they can report when they're going with their college um, admissions, mm -hmm. they don't need to report an AP score when they have a UConn credit that's offered. So I think it became down to what would be accept accepted by colleges, mm -hmm. and that was the decision maker. Okay. And you're looking at changing that, perhaps? Um, I, I can tell you, and I'm going to speak to one course specifically, what the um, teacher in one of the courses has done is he actually sits down and says to his students, you know, it'd be great, go for the UConn credit and take the AP exam, because if you can show that you can score high in this and get the UConn credit, it really looks like you've mastered the content. So he does a good job of counseling his students in that. Um, so it is a conversation. It's, um, it's one that we, we would love to have the benefit of an and versus an or. Um, but we recognize, too, that this is also the advanced placement exams do cost money for our students to take. And so it's recognizing that we're, um, what the end result and what we're looking to do is make them better candidates for college admission. And the second thing was that when you mentioned the benchmarking, it sounds like you were looking at that at the teacher level, but it seems like it would also be important to do that at the administration level because it seems to me like the rules by which you operate obviously determines the success rate, and I'm sure other schools who are successful do it perhaps differently. So just a thought. I think that's a wonderful thought. Um, in terms of uh, the U.S. News and World Report stat that you were sharing with us, uh, what what is their criteria again for the AP exams? Is it percentage of seniors that are have taken at least one 
AP mm-hmm. AP course, not an exam, yeah. I should say. So the denominator is the amount of 12th graders you have sitting in your school, and then the numerator is how many students have taken an AP exam. At any point during their high school At career. At any point during their high school career. Okay. Um, and it's the exam itself that they're looking for. Um, not right the now, course, not course registration. Right now, mm-hmm. it, we have it by the exam that I, when I'm doing my homework, that's what I'm seeing. Um, but but I, th- I do, I would like to just make certain I'm 100% on that as I give that back to you. But yeah. I'm going to say to you, because really right now, we can tell you the vast majority of our students are have and are taking AP exams. So, And that, that is critical. I mean, if, if we care about that, statistics mm-hmm. it, it's critical mm-hmm. um, only because if we if we're contemplating moving away from every AP student takes the exam then that could potentially hurt us on that one one measurement <coughs> and we may be okay with that we may say that we're doing this for a very specific reason, and that's and we've got some really good reasons for doing that. I just want to make sure that we're not inadvertently hurting ourselves <laughs> when we're trying to do a good thing. We're trying right. to improve. And and I think and that's that right there, Mike, is exactly what I think we're wrestling with. Is part of this is that you want to say every student should take an AP, but then you recognize that sometimes. All right, so just to follow up, um, if we do move to a policy of allowing more students to not sit for the AP exam, even though they're enrolled in the AP course, Mm -hmm. it sounds on that one, like on on that one measurement, it could possibly hurt us, but it will help us in another, on another measurement, which is the the score sheet that you were just showing us Mm -hmm. of the percentage of students who score at a three or higher, Mm -hmm. that percentage, I can tell you right now, will go up. And there's a number of reasons for that. (laughs) And and I think that's exactly, is that taking a look in, and which one is reflective of of Mm -hmm. what we're actually experiencing here at our high school. Um, It it is a balancing act, and that's where we do want to have parameters around this. We're not just saying anyone cannot take an AP exam. That's where we're limiting it to one. Um, that's where we also talked about having it where it has to be signed off by both the teacher and the counselors to make certain that this isn't just a, a flippant decision. Sure. And I, I, you know, I teach at a school where students are, have carte blanche as to whether they take the AP exam or not. And, you know, that has its own set of, of challenges. And, and, um, but on the upside, you have students who are sitting for the AP exam who truly feel that they're ready, you know, and the data that they're gathering from their teachers when they're taking practice AP exams in the class is telling them, you're going to score at X level. If, you know, why force a student to take, sit for an exam that they know that they are not prepared for? Um, so that makes sense to me. Um, I've also had some students say to me, the college that I'm going to will not accept AP credit for this course at all. And I have a hard time forcing students to spend money um, for an exercise that's not that fun. I don't think a- too many AP exams are fun experiences. They may be rewarding experiences, but they're not fun. And so forcing students to pay money for something that's really not going to give them any benefit, that, that I have a hard time justifying as well. Um, and so a little bit of flexibility might be a nice way to compromise mm-hmm. both of those approaches of either forcing them to take the AP exam under every circumstance versus we're throwing the gates open and you decide totally. Yeah, if I could, Mike, I just want to follow up on that. We've got to be careful. Being small is, is a problem because we run into the law of small numbers. We're in a school as, you know, that's it's a multiple of size-wise of our school. Allowing that flexibility doesn't necessarily bend you know, the, the, the grading curve like, like U.S. News would use when they do their, their math. We're so small that that could really have an adverse effect on how we're, how we're measured, how we measure ourselves. So I think we need to be really thoughtful ab- about that because of our size. You know, it's, it's, in this case, it's, it's a detriment because 
to, to flexibility. So, Alan. Um, well, I, I wonder if, I mean, if we look at the, the numbers here, and then we look at the next page, the top sentence on the next page, all students are encouraged. I think that's where my question is. It, you know, if we look at the outset of the balance of this, because what we're seeing now is a perfect average. C is average, right? Which means, to my mind, we have too many people in advanced placement because we have, it's not advanced, it's everyone. And therefore, if you have everyone, you're going to end up with a bell curve right smack in the middle. And I... I, 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 I know we have a very um, student-centered and, and encouraging aspect to everything we do here, but I wonder how much we need to think of advanced placement as something that is advanced and that our concept of being able to offer all of our students an advanced placement experience may be the root of the problem here because not everyone should have an advanced placement experience. And you, you have a situation where it's like saying, well, I would like to have a, a, a varsity basketball experience. You don't get that because you haven't played basketball before or you've been, pretty, you've been on that bench for, for three years or whatever it is. And it's, I think we tend to feel that any kind of what we would feel the limits imposed on a student or disappointment is going to be detrimental to their, their grit or their self-esteem or their perseverance in general. I think we need to examine how we can properly um, encourage students without encouraging them into territory that is really not for them. And and I don't mean to be that in an exclusionary way or an elitist way, but there certainly are kids who, you know, for, I, I took AP English and I was good at it. If I had taken AP French, you know, people would have been like, no, 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 do not do that. Or uh, I'm trying to think of other classes that, are, yeah, you know, I was even discouraged, remember, from AP history, even though I, uh, there, there were certain APs that I was encouraged from and some I was discouraged from. And there are a lot of kids who were encouraged to take seven. They were smarter than I was. And there are a lot of kids who were encouraged not to take any at all. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really unfortunate if, if we're thinking of getting to the point of having the experience of what it's like as a senior or a junior to be in college, which is a little different. You take less courses very often and you focus differently and, and you, ha you don't have any commuting time. And it, there is a different experience in college. But if we're just thinking, let's see what this is like as a junior or senior, and then considering at a different juncture whether they should be forced to or encouraged to or allowed not to take the exam, I think that's the wrong place in the choice, which is why we're in this dilemma. I think you make the choice before whether you encourage them to take the co course or even support whatever pressure they have or whatever pressure their parents are putting on them or peer pressure, whatever you need to support so that the juncture of the decision comes before. Because if you take the experience and then you are decide, oh, I'm not going to take the exam, then what is the experience? The experience has been a really stressful way to learn something that you probably could have learned in a less stressful way in the same amount of time as a regular physics class as opposed to an AP physics. So I, I, as I said, I, I, I know I'm going on off and uh, long-windedly like I tend to do sometimes, but I know it's just a really delicate subject, and that's why I wanted to approach, approach it really sensitively, but also really, I think, make a demand that we, we really examine what our real interests are and our real goals are in terms of uh, that first line on the next page, encouraging every student. I, I, I hear what you're That's saying. I, I also think that one of the fears and concerns being a small school is that the amount of students who sit in that class, I, I think we also have to look at, we have the opportunity to provide that experience. And sometimes that experience is enough to get students to take that step to go to college. And I think there's also that, I mean, sometimes a hidden curriculum is a good thing. And the hidden curriculum here is, we believe every student that graduates from Chipog 
has the opportunity to go to college. And we believe it so much that we're going to give them this experience here while they're in our safe space. Yes, I'm going to tell you are absolutely right, Ellen. It is impacting our percentages. But it's also one that what we have to weigh out is, but what we're showing our students is we believe each and every one of them are going to be able to go beyond our stage in order to take that collegiate experience if that's what they would like to do. So I'm going to say to you, yes, you're right. We compromise ourselves, but we also encourage our student. Sure. And that's really what I love about Chapag. So I, I actually, I appreciate um, the list of things that you put forward to sort of to, to tackle this from all angles because I do think that that offering the experience and having the 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 faith in our students and uh, that is something that is part of what makes Chapag special. But if we were al to allow students to be excused from taking one AP exam and if we review the courses and we do the counseling and we kind of nibble at all the edges, I, I think we can actually move that number more than the 5% that you're looking for. Um, and, and then with obviously the one outlier class that's been a challenge yeah. for us. Because if you look at all the other classes and if you were to let a couple of students possibly not take the exam, you know, we're not, I don't think we're really as far as, as we feel like it, it, yeah. it might be so so you know we went we, we were at a place where we had no hardly any students taking the exam for all the reasons Michael pointed out it's expensive and it's not fun and a lot of colleges don't take the credit anymore but so then we went so we went all the way to making everyone take it so we got you know participation up so so I think you know we're, we're working on finding the balance um, and I, I feel like before we before we make drastic changes, if we continue, if we, you know, I love all of those ideas up there, and I think as long as they're handled, you know, the, between guidance and administration, you know, policy procedure, figure out how how exactly that will work. It's a small school; it's not a huge number of students that that uh, you would have to be figuring out so I, I appreciate that um, one thing I to to back up sort of bef the whole it just AP in general sometimes I worry that we we've just jumped on this AP train and that it's a racket and that <laughs> they're a money-making machine you know I just I get frustrated because it's it's this thing that you know the colleges are looking for it so we've got to do it and I know there are schools right around us who have pushed AP all the way down to freshmen and sophomores where they take AP Euro or AP um, Gov over two years I don't know I, I, I want to make sure we're not losing sight of curriculum and what we feel is appropriate and um, I, I just don't want to go too crazy either I, I, I feel like we've got a pretty good balance of, of it being sort of the last step um, that you don't start there but that you finish there and we've got you know our science and our math and our humanities um, I just don't want to get too deep into I don't know the US News and World Report I want to make sure the curriculum and and uh, is valued and that we're teaching what we believe is the right thing I agree and actually early on I'm, I'm gonna share Greg when you shared with me early on um, the private schools, some of the private schools are, are doing away with advanced placement um, testing and offering some of these AP courses. And I'm going to tell you I'm slightly competitive. So my first response was, well, of course, because that's the only thing that we're going to actually be able to compare ourselves with them with because they don't have to take our state tests and other things. Um, but to also say, I, I say that with a smile, but it is about keeping balance. And I think that is an important part to this is we wanna have a well-rounded program. 
And sometimes we're asking our students younger and younger to pick what is their concentration? What are you gonna be when you grow up? Let's, let's start stockpiling in high school. And sometimes we lose the ability to shape that entire child. But there is, again, that, that part that I want is to let all of our students know that we do believe in them. And here's the opportunity, and here's where something you can try to stretch yourself and beyond. And this is what it's going to feel like next year. Now that said, that's probably my bigger question and bigger concern is are we giving them a false advertising of what a college course is going to feel like? And that's where we want to make certain we still have that rigor, but we provide support. We recognize, yes, they're high schoolers taking a college level course. So this is where right now I'll tell you when you look at my list, it's, it's the low hanging fruit. It's the stuff that I think we can look at. We can say, here are the tweaks we can do. But it's going to be very important that we're looking at that deep dive. And I can tell you, Teresa's continuously looking at curriculum, working with the departments, making certain they have PLCs and are working with one another, and making certain we're reflective of our practices and are they aligned. And I'm going to say to you, sometimes they're not always aligned because, for example, we want all students to take the course and we want all students to take the exam, but we don't know that all of them were ready. We wanted to... It's, it's talking out of both sides, but as long as the students feel that we're challenging them and that we're making them think differently, that's the experience we want to provide for them. Stephanie, did you? I'm sorry. You had your hand up before. Yeah. <clears throat> Are there any types of surveys at the outset? Do we survey the students at the end of their AP experience? Not, I know you, you mentioned maybe about the teaching staff, but more about, you know, did, did they feel like it was a worthwhile experience? Did they take, did they get good numbers on the test? Were they demoralized at any point by not being able to reach a benchmark? Um, you know, like you said, this is, this is uh, an opportunity for them and some students to decide whether they want to go to college or not. Um, did it backfire? Did they decide this, you know, wasn't the experience that I wanted it to be. That's, that's a fantastic um, survey for us to be doing. I think you're absolutely right. I, that's, there's a disconnect in how we made them feel at the end of it, I think, is important. Yeah. Greg? If your goal is to encourage every student to take an AP course, why don't you just get rid of your regular courses and make them all AP courses? Because there's a difference between AP and honors levels. No, what, why should there be? If AP is the gold standard, we want every kid to have AP experience, why not make every course AP? What, 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 why not just get rid of the regular courses? See, what, I, what I'm afraid is, I think, Mr. I think Mr. Brown is spot on on this. I think that, that the, the, the central reason why our, our scores are low is because we have too many people taking the course that have not mastered their high school lessons sufficiently that they can benefit from this college course. And it's a nice thing to do, and it's a lovely thing, and we're all happy about it, but if, if we're concerned that our scores are too low, and all you're going to be able to do is, is play around the margins of this and maybe increase it a couple of points, but it's still going to be woefully low, then let's declare this a fool's errand and move on and forget about it. Because I don't think we're accomplishing anything with this whole AP dig, other than to have discovered the problem is too many people take AP courses, and that's why they have brought the score down. So if, if, we, if we care about the score, if we care about the scores, then we should, we should change that situation and limit the number of people going into it. If we don't care about the scores, then why are we spending the time playing with the program? See, I, I, I think this is, a dis, this is a horrible disconnect where either way we turn, right. it's ugly. <clears throat> so sometimes what you have to do is put it back in the box, put it back on the shelf, and go do something else. And I think that's what we ought to do. Well, I, I think at some point you, you have to go slow to go fast, and you're controlling for the variables. I think if you change too many variables all at once, we're really not getting to the answer that we're looking at. So as we start to pull away, I think it's important. One of the things that right now... We've done the other side of the pendulum, and I don't like to live in the land of the extremes. It's not all or nothing. And I think it was where they said, okay, now everyone who takes an AP course has to take the exam. And so I'm not willing to go all the way over and to make it just free choice. So right now to at least limit it, to provide coaching, to give a little bit of room for wiggle, we can see what that does to our bumps. We can see what that does to our percentages. 
And so then we start to say, okay, now where's our next target? Where do we have to do? Is it something where, what if we just go to students free choice? What does that do? Because at the end, I still want to make certain that we are providing our students with a high school education that is top of the state. John? Yeah, uh, everybody nibbled around the edges, but uh, do some schools screen uh, AP course candidates and some schools, uh, schools do not, is that correct? Uh, you mean prereqs, John? Yeah, they, yeah. they prerequisites uh, with scores that they have to have. So they may have to achieve a B or better in whatever the course is. Exactly. Prior to. So that yeah. translates into the rankings. I mean, you get students who don't have the ability, but they're in the course anyway. Mm -hmm. You're definitely you have to you have to decide. Or do you want to um, bring the rankings up, the U.S. News and, and World Report rankings, or? Or do you want to give the student who does not really have the ability but will learn something in the course, you know, the chance, the opportunity to take the course? So, I mean, it's like we have to decide, you know, do we want, you know, a better success rate or do we want to bring up, you know, the rankings or, uh, or just offer the course for, the, for, you know, educational benefit? And I can tell you a third-hand experience um, that uh, when I was talking to one of our Chapaug teachers, and they talked about a student who was on the spectrum, who was placed in an AP course. And the student was not able to keep up with the writing and the demands of the research, however, was absolutely part of the conversation, elevated the conversation in the classroom, and was able to have that conversation and actually do it at a collegial rate. And I would hate to think that I kept that opportunity from that student because they didn't meet the prerequisites. So yes, there's always some of those students that, yeah, we stretch too far. But there are some that we've provided the opportunity where they have felt accepted, they have felt scholarly, and I don't want to also hold back from that opportunity. But to say to you, yes, it does come with a cost, and we have to make the decision of where do we draw that line. Um, <coughs> Sometimes when the floodgates are open, where do you shut the valves? Jen? I appreciate the work that you've done in terms of being able to move forward in a way that allows us to still be who we are, which I think is very important, and being able to find that sweet spot in being a small school and still being able to allow an opportunity for students who may have not had that opportunity in other schools or districts being able to stretch themselves. I think that that's a really important thing. And I think before we get over dramatic and just offer it to everybody to be facetious and sarcastic, and even though I don't necessarily agree, necessarily agree I appreciate the um, sensitivity that you had, Alan, in trying to describe it in a way that I, I, see, I completely see your point. So I'm, what I'm saying is, is that I think that you tried very hard to approach the subject with sensitivity. Um, I don't necessarily think that you did as well, Greg, but that's just my opinion. Um, I think that um, moving forward, I also um, agree with Michelle that the steps that you have just allow there to be some space to see if there can be some shift and change and maybe those students having the support to be able to take that risk and being the, the net to be able to have that happen, I think is a really important thing that does make us special. So I completely support that. And I hope that we move forward even a little bit further than your 58%. Stephanie. <clears throat> Just wondering, how much does the average AP test cost? And do you feel like we lose students because they can't afford it? And if there is a student that wants to take it that can't, do we have recourse for that? Um, the average $87 is the current rate, um, and it is one that, yes, we do ask our parents to pay for that. Um, if there's need, we always support any student who has need, so that's... Greg? Yeah, I just want to make it clear, because maybe I didn't, that I wasn't suggesting that you should offer the course to everyone. Mm -hmm. I was trying to use the benefit of a reducto ad absurdum argument mm -hmm. to say that at some point in time, these classes are not going to be offered to everyone because they're not for everyone. 
So either we should, either we, if we care about, if the test number is the metric we care about, then we should restrict access. If the test number is not the metric we care about, it's the educational benefits that these courses have, and you explained one instance of, of, of a child that added to it, even though they were not going to be able to keep up with whatever would have allowed them in or not in, in then if that's the metric that matters to us, if, if that's the quality of education that matters, then let's stop worrying about the U.S. world news and world report number and let's stop worrying about these numbers let's put it back in the box put it on the shelf say we did it we understood what it said and then let's move on it that's where the choice i think you're offering us you're, you're telling us we 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 can marginally tinker here and improve this number a little bit but we can't really improve this number a lot as long as our philosophy is more kids having an opportunity to have an ap experience so let's just say that's what we do and be done with it I, I recently watched this amazing speaker and his uh, quote was, the genius of and and the tyranny of or. Mm. I don't want to have or. I want to have and. Yeah, yeah I, I guess, you know, you said about the, the, yeah, yes. <laughs> the, uh, the student who was on the spectrum who, yes. who contributed so well to that class. I mean, I mean, isn't, we do still have honors classes that that one can contribute to on a higher level and and be collegial in. I mean, it's it's almost as if we are at a you know there's there's is there there's no stigma to honors. It's honors, so that I guess I guess I just wrestle with the idea of you know providing an experience that is not really supposed to be an experience. It's supposed to be a proving ground to your own ability to handle college and your college's ability to understand whether you can handle college. There are a lot of students who go to college without ever doing an AP exam um, at all. And a lot of colleges who accept a great number of their students who've never, you know, we're talking about the different, um, what do they call it, uh, admissions percentages, or, you know, the uh, from most competitive all the way, you know, the way, the way it works as far as the number of applicants who end up being accepted, you know, the high numbers of percentage. So I guess that's what I, I, I you know, I, I to try to be even more sensitive. If we could just consider that, is that what we are, whether the benefits of being able to encourage every child uh, can be presented to every child in a different way that doesn't get wrapped up in this AP US News nonsense. Do you know what I mean? And I think that's always been my, my concern is that, and it, I guess it's kind of what Greg's saying too, if we, if, if we really do care about this, then we have, to, we have to figure out how to get an asterisk for us in, <laughs> in, in US News and World Reports. But Otherwise, we just have to realize that, you know, is, is someone taking an AP course, is that really all that great? I mean, you know, it's, you know. We talk about U.S. news, but what about the, uh, Connecticut Net Accountability Score? How, how are they factoring in the AP? Don't they measure that? They do as well, yes. So are they measuring what? The number of students who take it versus the number of students who pass? Number of students, yes. Okay, so it's, this is more than just about a fixation on U.S. News and World Report. This is how the state is ranking us because compared to our peers. But right. our state ranking and all of that comes okay. into it. So the reason I picked so U.S. News and World Report, to be completely honest, is at some point we are advertising our school. This is I, where people are looking at us. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not, I don't okay. disagree in using U.S. News uh, as, as a data point. I'm just broadening the yeah. lens here, the aperture, that it's not just that. Correct. It's how the state is measuring us, whether you know, we can get into whether we like that or not. But the point is they are. And that's how our rankings and, are factored. And our students are weighed against how well we are preparing them as yeah. a college level. Right. So, so I think it's it is about safe to say, Alan, that, that we are, our ranking as a school in the state of Connecticut is, is, um, is being uh, hurt because of this. Right. Right. It's definitely being hurt. So that said, right. can you go back to the test scores for a second? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oops, sorry. <coughs> So when I scan down the list and I see, like, obviously 100, there's no argument there. But when you see 70s, mid-60s, 
What are we expecting? So if we, if we look at what we consider to be the best schools in Connecticut, the best schools in the nation, what, what is that number that they achieve? Is 70 a, a great place to be? What are we shooting for? Um, depends on the course that's offered. So I can tell you right now, if you look at psychology right now, if you look nationwide, 65% of the students score three or so higher. So it varies by course? It varies by course on okay. what it's going to be. So psychology is 65. Correct. Okay. Um, what is um, What would be calculus, for example? Would you know? Uh, calculus is a little bit lower. Um, we're actually doing well comparatively. In so in calculus, we're doing well on art, I guess that's, like I said, not an argument. What about uh, history? That's obviously a great score. Well, I was gonna say, we're doing pretty right? well in that. Yeah, <laughs> we're doing good there. 100% I don't. So my point is, if you look down the scores, it looks like we have two problem areas, sciences and humanities. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wait, uh, well, no, I think we have a particular problem in psychology, it's human. Human geography. That's well, no, oh, I'm sorry. Nobody took the test in human geography. Why? Well, no, one person took it, and that's why. Or is it, is oh. it, is it, is the human geography part of the six of 24? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. Lines, yeah. So if you peel that number apart, <clears throat> is psychology is the problem? Mm -hmm. Challenge area? Yes. That's an outlier. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I mean, we're talking in generalities about about the AP, which I think is healthy to do, mm -hmm. right? To understand, you know, where we could make adjustments and, 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 and we should continue to do that. But looking at, take those, those, you take those two outliers out and you recalculate our average, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now, Fair right? Because our averages would be great, we'd be happy, we'd be, we'd be have nice scores cool. by any, anybody's ranking system. So, well, we can take psychology out of well, well, we have to take well, sciences out of restoring No, I, well, all, I'm, all I'm saying is that let's not lose sight is that we might have some hot spots here mm. right. that need um, a different reaction that, you know, uh, is, is maybe included in that list. Maybe it needs to be specific about that issue. That, so it's a, it's a two-dimensional yeah. challenge yeah. that we have it's to work it, here. It's, uh, yeah. it's macro and micro. Yeah, so because we have some really bright spots here, yeah. like yeah. you know, seventy percent in calculus, and if that's higher than national average, then you know that's a bright spot. Let's yeah. let, let's not true. lose that in all this. Yeah. But we have some challenges that we need to think through and and and, and fix. That's so. That's the point I just wanted to. No, and if you look at you know when we talk about that's what we're currently evaluating. Is, is yeah. what needs to change. We also know that within the sciences, some of the things that are tested within it, um, I think we had one student who just wanted to try um, physics, didn't actually take the course, just went on the virtual high school to just try taking the AP exam. So there's, there are some factors that we also recognize that, uh, that do impact some of our scores. But that said, we are looking at all of those. But when Good. there's some clear outliers that we have to say, is that something that, is it a fluke? Is there historic trends? If there's historic trends and we've tried to remediate and we continue to not be able to, then what can we do differently and do we replace an offering? And that's part of the evaluation process okay. right now. So, then Mike. Just very quickly, there's, there's two trends that I, I want to um, applaud you on. Um, one for Chapog is that we, we believe in students challenging themselves. And as, as a board, we've supported the growth of the AP program for all of its warts, for all of the fact that it's not the perfect program. Um, we have it, and it's been growing. More and more students are taking that challenge, and I think that's a good trend for us to recognize as a board. I think, too, for us to spend time, as you have in conversations, with teachers and administrators in the district about ways to work to improve our AP program. That's an incredibly valuable program. I think just, you know, isn't there a law in science that just by examining, <laughs> just by doing the experiment, you're going to be influencing? Um, and influencing, I think, in a positive way. I mean, um, you might have been talking about some of the modest changes you're proposing, but 
Um, I think that the, the effect is going to be more than modest. I think you're going to have an outsized right. effect just by drilling down, just by having conversations. When I saw something about you encouraging AP teachers here, who may be the only person that they could, <laughs> that's teaching a section of AP, to maybe go to other districts nearby and say, what are you doing, colleague? I know you're teaching AP physics. Could, you, could we have a conversation about what works for you? I think that's wonderful. The more you can encourage that, the more I think you're going to see benefits in lots of ways, not just increased um, three, fours, and fives. Yeah. Last question. Keep forward here. Um, also, just a random curiosity, looking at the two outlier classes, um, I think the total there is like 57 students between the two. Why are those two classes so popular if, if the test scores also happen to be on the on the fringe yeah. um, the psych the and sciences well, I can right. tell you I um, <laughs> and and this is where I can say to you sciences is because there, there are multiple courses that are involved in that so there's AP bio AP chem there's physics that are so th that houses <laughs> multiple students um, so that is popular uh -huh. um, but to <laughs> say that psychology I think um, that has been one of the popular um, AP courses of choice. I think um, sometimes people may have a misconception about the work demands that may happen in psychology. Um, I also think that there's something to be said. We've now just introduced AP stats. AP stats and AP psychology should be working hand in hand. At some point when you get and you're sitting down on your AP exam for psychology, you're talking more about your Z-scores, your T-scores, what is your statistical anomalies, your outliers, and are we working on making certain that they understand the different variable changes, or are we more focused on the studies and the case studies? So it is also taking a look and saying, how is the approach and what was the expectation of the students who came into that course? Right, I'm thinking more so. of like the message because some of those other classes like an AP Calc or Physics or you know they have that heavier connotation that that's going to be a really difficult class. Are there kids going into it thinking it's psych, is that going to be easier? Do we need to send the message that this is an, you know, a, a college level class? This is going to have components of science in it. This and is going to have components of and I can say, I think, analysis, and, you know. and you're absolutely right. We, we want to make certain it's elevated. Mm. Uh, Teresa and I early on looked at the results because we said, okay, well, how about, is it just kids who are just trying? You know, um, we found of the, of the um, 23 students taking psychology, we found nine of them had multiple AP um, tests, I mean, AP courses they were taken. So those tend to say, okay, were they very serious AP students? Where were they in that? So we're trying to look at it from all the angles. Right. I think your statement of is the message that that's, that is the, the starter course for an AP or, no, or whatever it is. It's in a random student that's going to so say, let me just try AP physics. Yeah, it, it, you know? it, it could like, very well be. Let me just like, try you know, hey, it's, it's like diet yeah. AP, you know, and I, you know, but no, to say um, there may be that factor that goes into it. Right. Um, and, <clears> you know, it's also very likable you know, teachers, and sometimes they say, oh, right. I love this person, I want to be in their science class, or this has been a great, sometimes teacher choice helps them decide who's right. going to be um, their AP instructor. So there's a lot of factors, but I think that your statement is true, is was that considered the entry um, point for AP, but it's not. And what right. we're really seeing is, is there's a seriousness of that course, and if we're not matching that um, with preparation and getting our students to understand, then that's, that's a misfire on our part. Okay. Uh, Alan, do you oh, I just want to say, will, will you come, this seems like a, a, a big process with, and, and really well thought out with all of the different criteria that you're going to be examining. Will you come back to us yeah. um, and, and revisit this with whatever you've gained? Because I would hate this to go an entire new year and then go, all right, well, we lopped off two points here. And, oh, you know, it would be nice to, if we could, without clogging down our meetings and making them all three hours long, be able to re-contribute as we go. I, I am happy to provide updates, and I think that's one of the things that I'm proud of thus far as we've started our journey together as board and superintendent, um, the reoccurring things that keep coming up on our agendas, you know, the recurrence of 
um, agri-science to make certain that we're re-looking at things time and time. So whereas Teresa laid the groundwork for me to talk about the AP scores tonight, making certain that we're coming at it again and again, so I'm happy to come back and talk about it because we want to be able to say, where are we in this progression? Um, like the kids, we don't want surprises. Yeah, Alan, that's what I was actually going to be my closing oh, question. Sorry. No, it's perfect because it's, it's, I'm glad you did that. Uh, it, it is something, you, you know, these, these are not trivial discussions, right? right? And uh, for the board to visit these, you know, once, once a year, you know, just really seems inadequate, you know, given, given the conversation. You know, um, so uh, I do think we need to hear periodically where Megan and the team is going, what help they need, what guidance they need from us as we, as we, as we go forward. Um, so it's good. I'm looking forward to hear the next, the next chapter. So um, with that, thank you. thank you very much. Good, good discussion. Um, robust discussion uh, and you know I think we, we, we got some some good points some really good points <laughs> not, and, and not easy points but but good ones that needed to be made and, and discussed so well done Michelle keep us keep us moving here all right policy first reading of uh, 5141 um, school district medical advisor yeah, so this, uh, if you open your packets, this um, policy was provided for you. This is a first reading. Um, the highlight, or it's the uh, same procedure as always. The uh, yellow is new. Um, for, this, for this policy, there are two places where you'll see some blue language that was added by our nurse and was then reviewed by um, CABE and our medical advisor. So this policy we actually worked on in committee last year, and then it went to our medical advisor and our school nurse to, for a review. So that's why it took a little time to get back to um, the school board, but or to the board of ed here. So uh, if, as you look at the changes um, in yellow, most of it is, uh, Again, the age grades of when testing or screenings have to happen. Um, a few new uh, tests that the state is requiring. If you scroll all the way down to the bottom, you'll see, where is it? Public Act uh, 758 was amended. Um, health assessments 10-206. So that, there was this, this state updated what they wanted I can't I can only answer questions about procedure and Michelle uh, policy I have a procedural question yeah in I just lost it it's oh what page is it on uh, I know you just kind of have numbers. to scroll give it me a of, heading I don't know kind of felt like halfway through the document it says the Board of Education shall designate a representative to receive these reports from the health care providers. What board, are they talking about the Connecticut Board of Education or this Board of Education? Um, I, let's see, are you just above vision screening? Give me a. I'm just above vision screening, okay. right in the middle. It's a one sentence yep, shall, and The Board of Education, no, they mean us. And, and, and that would be our, our um, medical advisor. Wait a second. Assessments, no, that would probably be the nurses then. So the nurses handle the... the screening. The nurses handle the health reports in okay. the buildings, but the mm -hmm. procedure is overseen by the medical advisor. So it says we should designate annually. So every year we should be in the beginning of a year making this designation? But it's usually our medical. Dr. Altarelli is our medical advisor, but no, and he's no, he's our as a, as a body. It's a rolling, it's a rolling. Oh, he's been he has been for. Well, what I'm what I'm. I mean, and if he retires, then we'll have to appoint a new one. But he he doesn't charge us for his services, and he's local. 
I mean, if you want to. Well, I'm just saying if we're not if we're not literally taking a step at the beginning but of I don't, the I'm year. I'm not sure that's what this says because this says to receive reports of health assessments and immunizations from health care providers. Oh, this is, these are the nurse. child, these are the nurse, the this nurse. is the nurse receiving the records for the children in the building. Like you know how you have to. You have to turn in the blue form. Come on. I, I, I know that. I'm on the first part of the sentence. The board shall annually designate. That's an action that the board, to my knowledge, hasn't taken. So if we're going to say it's the nurse and we want to do that, I'm just suggesting that maybe we just write it such that we don't need to literally do that. If not, then it's fine. And at the beginning of next year, we can make sure that the first thing we do is designate the person. The nurse. Maybe so I, I'm annually? just, it's just, yeah, a, yeah. just, a, just a, uh, well, before we remove it, I have to just make sure right. yeah, yeah, we're yeah, allowed I'm to remove it. To but I, but before a second sense. reading, I'll make sure that that language needs to be in there. Let me just write it down. Yeah. Because we could change it to read that we'll designate this, you know, this, the, the district nurse to, uh, to be the, the representative. Is to simply indicate that in the event we don't designate anyone, that it, that's because we have retained the one from that was previously existing. From previous year. Okay. Well, I mean, you, I, you can you can do something that automatically refills in case you don't remember to, to change the designation. That's another way to do it. That's commonly okay. done. Your cue. Oh, oh yeah. I. Uh, it, it all looks fine except for I'm confused. A couple of two paragraphs up from up from where Anthony was, a child will not be allowed as the case may be. Why, do, I don't why know is that, that in there. as the case may be, that kind of means a child will not be allowed, eh, or maybe will. <laughs> I don't understand um, what that means. I think there was some provision up above, above, though, that some are mandatory and some are not. So. Well, it says a child will not be allowed, as the case may be, to begin or continue in district schools unless health assessments are performed as required. So, well, I, know, I just don't understand because it, it looks like it was added. Yeah, and it's yellow, so that it so was that added. So the, I will I mean, find Dave out why. It? All right. You know, I just wonder what the case is. That's all, because I, I couldn't find a precursor to what the case. Is. I it feel says like I remember reading up above right. that uh, there there are some po possibilities for exemptions. Right. But I think they're the exception, not the rule, which is why that was added. But, I but it does say health assessments are performed as required. So if there's exemptions, exemptions and they're not required. I don't know. We won't need to take too much time, but if you want to check into it, then. As the case may be. Right. As the case may be. Wrote it All down. right, so do I have a motion, Michael? Yeah, I'll move that um, we accept for a second reading policy. First, first, first. reading. Is there a second? A second. <gasps> Whoa. Well done. <laughs> Julie, you win. <laughs> Julie, you win. Sorry. <laughs> Any further questions? <laughs> all right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? <laughs> the motion passes. <laughs> Policy 5141 for first reading. You did, Jen, but it was much, much louder coming from there. All right. All right. I'm going to request. First reading. I'm going to request that 6142.101 student nutrition and physical activity be postponed till the December 3rd meeting. Um, the wrong version was attached, and it had a couple of options in it. So I, at least I think that's okay. what happened. So we were, we're going to right. bring that one back. We'll table. We'll table that one. All right. Yeah, yeah, post, 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 postpone. Post, post. Sorry, postpone. Can, can I ask a question about this? Can I ask a question about this policy? Yeah. Sure. Uh, because there were, I mean, I saw a couple options in here, and I thought the option to leave it in was a bad idea. And so the question, I guess, is, is, is how much of this is really required by that change in the law? Because this is, there's some hoary stuff in here. I mean, there's no way we're going to succeed, even remotely succeed, in getting kids to have 60 minutes of activity a day unless you start counting all kinds of things like the amount oh, of walking. Some of that, I believe, is in the law. Um, the reason this has taken so long to come to get back to us is it was with our um, wellness committee for a long time. Um, 
but I believe the, the minutes of motion is, is law. The, the options were some of the nutrition things, and, and they made recommendations. I, I just have to figure out what, which options we were taking. Well, I would strongly suggest that you take out the provision that says non-sold foods and beverages. In other words, you, some, somebody, some parent brings in a, a cupcakes, and if they don't meet the federal They're not allowed. standards, They're not they got to go. First of all, how would you ever monitor that situation? Who would certify that they meet the standards? We don't allow cupcakes anyway, remember? <laughs> well, I know, but Talk maybe, to Valerie about you know, maybe they'll bring in, I don't know, apples, but they won't be nope, the right. don't allow them either. But, but I, nope. I guess the point is, things like that. No food at all. Where, where we're not required to do it, I think we should always err on the, time, on, on the side of jettisoning it. Uh, unless there's a really good reason to put it so in. Noted. And this is the kind of thing. All right. Possibly. So noted. Well, yeah, I, and we can, uh, we can look at the actual wellness policy requirements by the law uh, as well. So when I bring that back, I will try to clarify some of that for you. Okay. I'd like to make a motion. Go ahead, Al. I move we go into executive session for the purpose of discussing a personnel matter. A second. All those in favor? Aye. Well, it's opposed. All right. We are, what room? Uh, 25. Okay. 